If that's not proof of life, I'm not sure what is. Maybe I should have said there's no proof that either of them are still alive. Sam paused. Heads up. Something is coming your way. That heavy sense of wrongness sharpened abruptly. It might simply have been a reaction to his warning, but I doubted it. I care to get a little more descriptive than something, Jackson said. I would if I could, Sam said. Whatever it is, it's moving in a mass and coming at you from two sides. Two? How? I said. There's only one stairwell. It's coming from both the street level and from the roof. Leaving us the meat and the sandwich. Lovely. Jackson glanced at me. Do you want to do the honors, or shall I? You keep searching the labs. Fire still drains your strength too fast. He grunted and headed down to the next doorway. I ran back to the stairwell and carefully opened the door. The thick stench of decay hit like a slap in the face and made me gag. We'd obviously left the ground floor door open for the smell to be this bad. But other than that, there was no sound, and nothing that would indicate anything else had changed. Sam, are you sure they're coming up the stairwell? I didn't mention the stairwell. I said it was coming at you from top and bottom. Then how... I stopped as an odd sound echoed up from the emptiness below. It was little more than the soft bounce of a stone down concrete steps, but it nevertheless sent a chill down my spine. Sam might not have mentioned the stairwell, but there was definitely something in there. I sent the sphere in, making it bright enough to light the entire stairwell, then walked over to the metal railings and peered down. And saw faces looking up at me. The decaying dead had come back to life. I swore and called fire to my fingertips. Even as I did, the cloaks roared, the sound oddly garbled and barely resembling anything human, then surged up the stairs toward me, moving so fast that bits of flesh and God knows what else sprayed across the concrete walls. M. Report. Sam's voice was sharp. What's going on? What's that sound? The dead are screaming, I said. So shut up and let me deal with them. Which probably wasn't the wisest thing to say to the man who was technically my boss. At least for this mission, but hey, what was the worst he could do? Sack me? I flung several streams of fire at the nearest cloaks. The flames leapt from one rotting carcass to another, until the entire stairwell was lit by a moving mass of burning flesh. It didn't stop them. Maybe they couldn't stop. Maybe Luke's very last order had been to protect the labs at all costs. I drew in a breath and called to the mother. Her power tore through me, almost seeming intent on tearing me apart, as she erupted from my flesh and arrowed undirected toward the burning cloaks. In an instant they were ash. I sighed in relief and released her, but she didn't retreat. Rainbows of light pulsed across the darkness, and my heart momentarily beat in time. And that scared the hell out of me. If I became too in tune, I would become one with her. Everything I was, and everything I could be, all my hopes and dreams and energy, would become a part of her. There was no escape from such a fate, no rebirth. And while that was the eventual fate of all phoenixes, it was not yet my time to fade into her sweet embrace. I was not yet tired of life, however much I might wish our ill-fated path to love would, just once, end differently. I backed away from the rainbow flare, and the connection between us snapped, the force strong enough that it sent me staggering backward. I flung a hand against the wall and briefly closed my eyes, battling the lethargy that washed through my limbs, though it stemmed as much from relief as weakness. One thing was very obvious. I'd have to stop relying so much on the mother to get me out of tough situations. Her grip, and the temptation that came with it, was becoming a little too strong. 
I pushed away from the wall and sent my sphere of flame spiralling upward. Thankfully, no more rotting, broken faces were revealed. One stairwell clear of cloaks, I said. Are the sensors still catching movement, Sam? At the moment, no. I've called in the military to guard the perimeter of the shielded area, though, just in case they try to escape. I doubted they were trying to escape, but it was nevertheless a good idea. If the cloaks were all contained within the area, for whatever reason, then it was better to keep it that way. Even if it wasn't exactly better for us. Heading back to finish checking the labs, then. I stepped back into the hallway, then hesitated. While the stench of decay should give ample enough warning that there were cloaks on the move, I wasn't about to risk anything else sneaking up on us. I directed my sphere back to the doorway and fanned the energy out until it covered the entire exit. It didn't contain much heat and certainly wouldn't damage either the doorframe or the walls around it. But if anything went through it, I'd feel it. I found Jackson in the third lab. Anything? He shook his head. Another laptop, but that's it. I frowned. No notes? Because Baltimore preferred to jot his findings down as he was going, and he hated using computers during that stage of the process. Not a one. Jackson touched my back and ushered me out the door. We'll check the final one, then head up to the next floor. Hopefully we'll have more luck there. Sensing movement again. Sam said. Coming solely from the rooftop this time. I'm guessing the damn cloaks are the reason Ronaldo and his witch didn't want... No, I said before Jackson had finished. Frederick was surprised by the cloaks' actions in the Carlton Gardens. He wouldn't have been if he'd already clashed with them. Sensors indicate they're almost on you, Sam said. Your sensors must be copping interference again, Jackson said because there's no sign of them. Then something odd is happening, because there's no interference, and we're reading them as being right on top of you. I wasn't sure how much odder it could get than the decaying dead finding life, but I sure as hell didn't want to find out. I've got the door alarmed, Sam, so they must be waiting in the stairwell. That's not what I'm reading. Tension filled Sam's voice. Be careful when you enter that last lab. I'm thinking I'm not included in that you, Jackson thought. Jackson pressed his back against the wall and reached for the door handle. I doubt he wants you dead, Jackson. Too much paperwork involved, I thought. I waited as Jackson pushed the door open. Nothing moved in the darkness beyond, and the air was free from the putrid smell of rotting cloaks. Jackson sent his sphere in, and I flared it brighter. Aside from a couple of metal tables, the place was empty. We nevertheless entered cautiously. The only thing that stirred was dust. The room hadn't been used in a very long time. Well, this is a bust. Onward and upward. Jackson spun around and headed back out. I started to follow him then paused as I spotted something small and white sitting near the second table's leg. Hang on. I walked across and picked the item up. It was a torn bit of lined paper, the same sort of paper that came from the notebooks Baltimore had used. Heart hammering, I quickly unfolded the tiny scrap. CH3COOH, it read. Though I had no idea what it meant, I'd worked long enough with Baltimore to know it was some kind of chemical formula. Found something. I read it out. It might be a clue. It might not. We'll check, Sam paused. Are you sure there's no activity in your vicinity? We're still seeing movement right above you. No. I paused as something hit my shoulder. I frowned and flicked it off. Dust. Why would dust be hitting my shoulder? We hadn't stirred it up that much. The thought died. Above us, Sam had said. 
Oh, fuck. As I looked up, the ceiling collapsed. Chapter 6 It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I collapsed under its weight. But it wasn't just plasterwork and metal, but also flesh, blood and decay. The cloaks were all around me, even on top of me, and they used hands and teeth and God only knows what else to tear at my body, until the sharp scent of blood overrode even the stench of their rotting bodies. Pain was a wave that threatened to toss me into unconsciousness, and reflex and self-preservation rather than any conscious thought swept me from flesh to spirit. The nearest cloaks erupted into flame, but it didn't stop their attack. They continued to slash at me even as my flames ate at their flesh, their actions filled with an odd sort of desperation. For the first time since I'd first come across them, pity stirred. Most of them would not have invited this fate. Most of them would have done nothing more than cross the path of a madman, intent on using the virus to do what he would never have been able to do on his own. Become a leader. A major player. Emily! Jackson's desperate shout was both verbal and telepathic, and it cut through my drifting, still hazy thoughts. Where are you? Here. I'm okay, I thought. But I was in fire form, and still dazed, and I had no idea if he'd understand me. I couldn't speak any form of English when in this form, but maybe sending thoughts was different. Uh, not sure what language that was, he said. But at least you're alive and aware enough to reply. The fire burning the cloaks around me suddenly ramped up several notches. Jackson was feeding the fire I'd created, trying to eradicate the cloaks as quickly as possible. As they screamed and raged and fell apart around me, I started making my way up through the pile of debris and bodies. When I was finally free, I gasped in relief and for several seconds moved no farther. I simply hovered above the flames, devouring both flesh and rubble with equal ferocity, and sucked in the strength and heat of it. It wasn't enough, nowhere near enough, to completely refuel me, but it at least knocked the edge of weariness away. I turned around and spotted Jackson standing in the hall, or rather spotted the very top part of his head. The ceiling's collapse had blocked all but a foot or so of the doorway, which certainly wasn't enough space for a man of Jackson's size to crawl through. And while he could undoubtedly use the force of his flames to blast enough of a gap to get in, he'd feared to do so until he knew where I was, and whether I was in human or spirit form. Our connection, I noted, was definitely getting stronger if I was now sensing such information without his telepathically sending it. I gave him two fiery thumbs up to indicate I was okay, then glanced at the ceiling. Three quarters of it had come down, and not by accident. The metal struts that remained, poking out like fingers across the now empty space, had been cut. And not recently. The trap had been prepared long before. But why would Luke set it over an empty, unused lab? I glanced back to Jackson and motioned upward. I'll head up the stairs and join you, he immediately said. I spun several fingers of fire out from my body and quickly wrote, No, wait here. Damn it, Em, be sensible. Wait, I repeated in fire. Trust me. I do. I just don't trust the bastard who used to run this area. Safer, I signed. Report to Sam. I rose without waiting for his answer. A growl of frustration followed me, but a quick look back revealed he was doing as I asked and talking into the comm unit. The room above looked to have been some sort of storeroom. Metal shelving still lined three of the walls, and what little remained of the floor bore markings that indicated there had been other units as well. They were probably down below, in among the rubble and the dead. Dust sprinkled across my flames, and I glanced up at the ceiling. Only it wasn't there. It wasn't one ceiling that had come down on top of me, but two, which really didn't make much sense. 
I resisted the urge to go through the second hole to see what lay above, and moved to the storeroom's door instead. It was locked, but a quick burst from fiery fingers soon fixed that. The next room was vast and seemingly empty. I flared brighter, fanning the yellow-orange glow of my flames out farther. There were no more gaping holes in either the floor or the ceiling on this level, but a quick check revealed both had been weakened in several spots. There was also some sort of black, almost oily-looking moisture dripping from the ceiling. Trepidation stirred, though I had no idea why. If it were in any way dangerous or explosive, my flames would have set it off. I turned around and saw down at the very end a rather ornate door. I blasted it open with flames and headed in. It was an office, a huge one that stretched the entire width of the building. A rather expensive-looking teak desk that had to be at least twelve feet long dominated the central area of the room, and there was a no less impressive executive chair behind it. Several smaller chairs sat in front of the desk, and to the right there was a seating area complete with a coffee machine, its size rivaling that of the one Jackson had installed in our office. To the left of the desk there was, rather surprisingly, a sleeping area. Behind that was an exit, somewhat oddly positioned, given that the bed made access difficult. I did a quick check of the entire room, looking for anything out of place, or anything that suggested there might be another trap waiting. I didn't see anything, so I shifted back to human form and walked around the bed to inspect the oddly placed door. It was locked, but a quick spurt of heat took care of it. Behind it was a six-foot corridor and a second door. But this wasn't any old door. It was a heavy-duty metal one, and it rather resembled an airlock. Answers. That inner part of me whispered again. Hoping the whisper was right, but partly suspecting it was merely delusional, I stepped forward and tried to open the second door. The handle didn't budge, and after a quick search I discovered why. There was a key-coded lock and scanner behind a cleverly hidden panel on the right, and it was the sort that required not only the right number sequence, but also the appropriate fingerprint scan. If it required Luke's fingerprints, we were well and truly up that proverbial creek. Houston, we have a problem. I'm on my way up, Jackson said at the same time as Sam asked, what sort? A big fucking airlocked, armed with a scanner sort of problem. I can try shorting out the control box with fire, but don't. Sam's voice was urgent. We have no idea how the airlock is protecting or what reaction breaking it might set off. Which is exactly what I was about to say before you jumped in. Jackson, I added. Be careful coming up here. The floor above the other labs and near the stairwell has been tampered with, and it might be primed to collapse. No prob. He paused. Is there any more activity on your monitors, Turner? Because the stench in this stairwell seems to be getting worse the nearer we get to the roof. I hadn't felt him pass through the net I'd placed across the exit on the floor below, so it had obviously faded when the ceiling had collapsed on me. There's nothing showing, but these scanners are primed for human life, Sam said. If it's inhuman, spirit, then we wouldn't pick it up. Meaning they wouldn't pick me up when I was in spirit form. A very handy thing to know. So what do you want me to do about this airlock? Nothing. We'll deal with it. After all the shit we've gone through to uncover the thing, I'm not happy about walking away without knowing what it fucking contains. Frustration filled my voice. Unless you can find a secondary entry point into the area, we have no other option. And is there a secondary entrance? There's nothing indicated on the plans we have. What about the old police files? I asked. No mention there either. Jackson strode into the office and stopped just behind me. It's a rather sturdy-looking mother, isn't it? Yep. I placed my fingers against the wall to the right of the scanner. The plaster burned away from my touch, the white dust puffing outward as I pressed deeper into it. 
I was expecting it hit either a wood or metal frame. But instead I discovered a sheet of thick metal. I grabbed the edge of the plaster and tugged it away. Not just metal, but an entire wall of one. The plasterboard was little more than camouflage. Why would he even bother? Jackson had repeated the process on the other side, to reveal more of the metal wall. It doesn't make any sense when he controlled the entire area. I doubt Luke was responsible for this, I said. It was probably done by the drug cartel using this place before he got here. Jackson grunted. I guess we've no choice but to keep searching and hope we find something we can get into. We retreated and made a thorough search of the office. But there were no other exits, hidden or otherwise, and nothing in the way of computers, files or paperwork of any kind. In fact, there was absolutely nothing other than the unmade bed and a lack of dust to even indicate this place had been used recently. How many more floors has this building got? I asked as we carefully made our way back to the stairwell. Two, Sam said, including the rooftop. And the cloaks? If there are any more around, they're certainly not moving. Which hopefully means the rest of the bastards are dead, rather than just smelling like it. Jackson thrust open the stairwell door and looked up. All clear. We made our way up to the next level, and with every step the stench increased, until it felt like we were breathing in a cesspit. The sphere of light cast orange shadows across the bare concrete walls, highlighting the long strings of cobwebs and sending all the spiders except for the daddy long legs, skittering away. There was nothing else here, nothing that gave any hint as to why the smell was so bad. Not that I really wanted a hint. Hell, I'd be more than happy to simply retreat and leave whatever it was alone. But I rather suspected neither PIT nor Ronaldo would appreciate such a move. The next door was locked. Jackson hit it with fire, melting the mechanism with a little more finesse than he'd used previously. The door swung open, and the stench immediately became a million times worse. I really didn't think we'd ever find anything that smelled worse than the decaying cloaks, he said, slapping a hand over his nose. But for fuck's sake, this is vile. Which was vastly under-describing it, in my opinion. I'd never, in all my years of existence, smelled anything that came near the stench coming from this floor. Not even during the years when the Black Death was at its peak and the putrid corpses were tossed into the streets like any other rubbish. This wasn't just the stench of diseased or rotting flesh. It was also thick with the smell of ammonia and shit. Swallowing heavily and trying not to breathe too deeply, I quickly spun more energy into the sphere and sent its light across the heavy darkness. What it revealed was as gruesome as the smell. The entire floor was a vast sea of human remains, not whole remains, but bits and pieces. There were decaying heads piled up in mounds and entrails hanging from the metal ceiling struts. Bones were scattered everywhere, many of them bearing teeth marks, but all of them clean-picked. I think we just discovered one of the feeding pits for the cloaks, Jackson said. Although it could also be a rather awesome horror movie set. I took a couple of steps into the room, but stopped when the carpet began to squelch underfoot. I really, really didn't want to know what the black liquid that oozed away from my weight was. This wasn't always a feeding pit. Not initially, anyway. I pointed at the nearest bones. They're human. The ones in the sewers were mostly animals. Maybe he simply ran out of animals. And maybe these cloaks were placed here to protect whatever might be hiding in the metal room below us, and they simply began to turn on one another when hunger became too great. I waved toward the far side of the room. I'm betting if we walked across we'd see a hole that lines up perfectly with the portion of the ceiling that collapsed on me. That theory would make more sense if the collapse had happened in Luke's office, 
Not in an empty lab two floors down. Maybe he simply wanted to stop anyone long before they got anywhere near his office. I shrugged. Luke was dead, so we were never going to really know what he'd intended here. Shall we retreat to the roof and check that? What about the rest of that floor? Sam cut in. If you want this stinking cesspit checked, you can fucking do it. There's not enough money in this entire planet to entice me to take another step into this room. Jackson paused. And anyway, it's not like you're paying us, is it? You're not in jail, or otherwise confined, Sam bit back. Right now, that's payment enough. Jackson snorted. That would be a more acceptable answer if you weren't also using us to do your dirty work. Gentlemen, enough. The inspector's tone was curt. Emberly, if there's nothing obviously related to the current search in that area, move on to the rooftop. I stepped back into the stairwell and headed up. The rooftop door had been propped open by a large piece of metal, and the space beyond was littered with more body parts and dark pools of liquid. At least in the open air, the stench wasn't so bad. We did a quick check of the entire area, but there was nothing else here beyond blood-sprayed satellite dishes and silent air conditioning units. We reported all this and headed back down, detouring only to collect the three laptops we'd discovered. The cloaks that had littered the street in front of the building were gone. Obviously, they were the ones I'd burned in the stairwell. The door leading into the old warehouse remained closed, but as we approached, its surface began to shimmer. And that, I said, is warning enough that we'd better exit via the rubble pile. Jackson immediately swung around and started heading toward it. I wonder why the magic is still active. Ronaldo wants information, and he's hardly going to get it by keeping us locked in, especially since the entire area is crawling with PIT and military personnel, and not even a gnat could get in here right now. Maybe he's not responsible for it. Maybe it was part of Luke's trap. Luke was many things, but he wasn't capable of magic, Sam said. Are you sure? Because he infected Frederick and the three witches, and maybe that connection enabled him to do minor magic. I don't think the hive actually worked like that, Sam replied. If it did, he would have simply infected other scientists and passed the relative information to them from Baltimore and Wilson. Who says he hasn't? Jackson said. For all we know, there's a whole hive of scientists still working away in that metal box. Given there's been no reports of other scientists being snatched, that's extremely doubtful, Sam said. I'll meet you out in the lane. We began climbing the rubble. As I'd feared, it wasn't exactly rubble. Bits of metal and brick slipped out from under each step and bounced down the steep slope, until it seemed half the pile was racing away from us. This thing is going to collapse. Jackson caught my hand. Run. We raced up the slope as it grew more and more fluid, until we almost seemed to be running through a river of metal, brick, and plaster. The flaming barrier of magic was pulsing, fading in and out of existence, as if the slide were also affecting it. Its magic burned across my skin as we tore through it, but it held little heat and certainly no threat. We began slipping, sliding down the other side, and this time the rubble chased us, hitting our legs and backs with scary accuracy. It sounded like a goddamn express train was bearing down on us. Sam wasn't waiting for us at the base, and we certainly couldn't stop to look for him. As bigger and bigger bits of concrete began bouncing around us, Jackson tugged me over to the warehouse and all but threw me through the window. The laptop I was holding went flying as I did an awkward half-roll and skidded on my back for several feet, before coming to a halt hard up against the remains of a wall. I twisted around and saw Jackson in mid-air. He rolled with a little more elegance than I, and somehow ended up standing. A heartbeat later, 
The entire wall shuddered as dust and small bits of stone came blooming through the window. That was a little too close. He walked across and offered me a hand. You okay? I nodded and let him haul me up. Where are the laptops you had? He grinned and tugged his somewhat loose bulletproof vest forward, revealing the slim sides of the two laptops. Nice and safe. Yours? I waved a hand in the general direction it had flown. Uh, over there somewhere. Actually, Sam said as he appeared out of the gloom. It hit me square on the chest and knocked the breath out of me. If I didn't know better, I'd swear it was deliberate. I raised an eyebrow. How do you know it wasn't? Because you have the worst throwing arm I've ever seen. His tone was dry. I'll take the rest of those laptops, Miller. Jackson crossed his arms. And what about Ronaldo? He threatened to send the cloaks into an infecting rampage if we didn't hand over whatever information we found. I doubt there are any cloaks left. He said he had the scientists, I cut in. And two men is enough to cause chaos. Do you and the inspector really want to risk that? No, the inspector said before Sam could reply. Hand over the laptops, Miller. We're working on a solution. It had better be a good one. He handed the laptops to Sam, who took them across to the window. A black-clad figure appeared, and fire sprang to my fingers before I realized he was military. Sam handed the soldier the three units, then said, The laptop's on their way, Inspector. Excellent. Remain where you are until otherwise advised. Remain where we are, I echoed. What the hell for? Because we're undoubtedly being watched, even if this is a controlled area. The inspector's voice was curt. Until we know what is on the laptops, it's better if no one is aware we've retrieved them. The minute anything leaves Brooklyn, Ronaldo will know about it. Especially if he did have a mole in PIT's ranks. That is not a problem, as the laptops are not leaving, the inspector said. We have specialists waiting in a nearby building. The hard drives will be cloned, then any pertinent information erased and the laptops returned to you. Jackson snorted. And you don't think he'll realize what's happened? No, because you'll be escaping our clutches and finding your own way out of Brooklyn. There isn't another way, I said. A bloody great trench surrounds the entire area, remember? That shouldn't be a problem for a being who can become flame or take a winged form, Sam commented. So they knew about my firebird form. I wondered how, given it wasn't something mentioned that much in all the myths about us. It's the middle of the goddamn night. I'm not about to risk outing myself by taking on a form that hasn't been seen in centuries around these parts. If it had ever been seen around these parts... And it's not like I can grow wings or become flame, Jackson said. So the trench remains a problem. I'm sure there's enough rubble and scrap around to form a makeshift bridge, the inspector said. You have little choice, I'm afraid. Not if you wish to keep Ronaldo on side and endanger no one else. And that was the shitty part of this whole situation. If we didn't do as we were told, people would suffer... I already had the blood of one innocent on my hands. I really didn't want any more. I sat back down. If we were going to be here for a while, then I might as well be comfortable. Sam stayed near the window, his arms crossed and his stance relaxed, while Jackson prowled around like a caged animal. I closed my eyes and tried to catch some much-needed sleep. I must have succeeded, because when the inspector spoke again, I jumped. The laptops have been cleansed and are on their way. She barely finished saying that when the black-clad figure appeared at the window again and handed Sam a backpack. Hardy Street provides the best exit point. The trench is slightly narrower there. Have the guards been warned we're coming out? I asked. No. 
We need it to look like an authentic escape. She paused. The sensors have been placed on both sides of the trench. The minute you near it, the guards will be notified. Meaning we'd be chased, and possibly even shot at. Wonderful. Sam, the inspector continued. Give them ten minutes, then report back to base. Will do. Oh, and Jackson, stop dumping the phone we gave you whenever you don't want us to know your location. We need to be able to contact you on short notice. Noted. In other words, he'd do what he damn well wanted, same as always. He flashed me a grin, then detached the comm unit and undid the vest before dropping both on the ground. I did the same. Once we got out of Brooklyn, they would only attract unwanted attention. Hardy Street runs off Francis. Follow it and you'll come to the trench. Sam handed Jackson the backpack. The military aside, there's no sign of movement in the whole area. And will the military stop us? I asked. No. What about the Witch's Shield? It's gone. Meaning whatever had been used to anchor the spell in position had been part of the rubble pile. When it had collapsed, it had either shifted or destroyed the anchor and shorted out the rest of the spell. I might just do a quick scout first, Jackson said, handing me the pack. Not that I don't trust your intel, Turner, but, well, I don't. His grin flashed as he disappeared out the window. I don't know how you work with that bastard. Sam turned his comm unit off. But his distrust at least gives you and me a chance to talk. And what do we have to talk about? I crossed my arms and gave him a flat stare. With our history? Plenty. His voice was grim. But the fact of the matter is we have to work together. I think it would be beneficial to clear the air. Beneficial. It was such an inoffensive word, but one that somehow had annoyance rising. Again, why? Hasn't everything that needs to be said already been said? Yes. No. He thrust a hand through his short hair, and for the first time since I'd rescued him, I saw a hint of uncertainty, maybe even a touch of vulnerability. Don't read too much into it. That internal voice warned. Remember what he said in Brooklyn, and heed the warning. I might often ignore that inner voice when it came to matters of the heart, but not this time. Damn it, Em, he continued. Just meet with me once. Let me say what I need to say. Why can't you say it here? Because Miller is on his way back, and I'd rather not have an audience. This is between the two of us, not P.I.T., and certainly not him. I hesitated. Meeting with Sam would be the stupidest move I could ever make. I knew that, but it didn't stop the desire to say yes. If I heard what he had to say, then perhaps I could gain some sort of, if not resolution, then maybe peace from the bitterness that still lay between us. And while Sam now understood the reason I'd had to be with Rory, even though I'd sworn my love for him, his refusal at the time to listen to any sort of explanation remained a festering wound deep inside. Maybe if we sat down and talked about it like the adults we were both supposed to be, we could finally move on from the past. Not that I actually could move on. He was it as far as this lifetime's love was concerned. In all my many lifetimes, fate had never gifted me with a second chance. It never would. Heartbreak was our destiny, our curse. I opened my mouth to agree, but what came out was a very flat, No. His expression tightened, but he didn't say anything. He simply nodded and stepped back. The darkness wrapped around him like a blanket and snatched him from sight, it was a vampire trick the virus had gifted him with, and one that had both annoyance and disappointment surging. 
I guess part of me had been hoping he'd argue the point and try to change my no to a yes. But maybe his desire to meet had been nothing more than a token gesture on his part, something he felt he had to do to appease whatever emotion I'd briefly glimpsed, and one he'd known would be rejected. Whatever the reason, I doubted the offer would be repeated, which was a good thing. And if I told myself that often enough, I might actually believe it. I spun around, hauled myself out the window, and strode up the street to meet Jackson. Whoa, he said, holding up his hands as if to ward me off. Don't aim all that fury at me. I'm not. I kept on walking. Good. He swung in beside me and matched the length of his steps to mine. What happened in the brief few moments that I was gone? Nothing. And that's what you're angry about. I gave him a look. He merely grinned. Do tell. Or shall I have to ferret away at your thoughts until I find out? Nothing happened, as I said. Now quit it so we can both concentrate on getting the hell out of here. The old saying, liar, liar, pants on fire, is decidedly appropriate right now, given your spitting flame all about the place. I glanced down and saw that he was partially right. I wasn't spitting fire, but every footstep unleashed a shower of fiery sparks. I laughed, as he'd no doubt intended, and rained the sparks in. Did you find our exit? He nodded. I also checked out the trench. It's just beyond leaping length. Which was no surprise, as that was exactly what Dimitri and Adan had intended when they'd created the thing. Anything we can use to make a bridge? He shrugged. Maybe. But I'm thinking we shouldn't exit where they want us to. I frowned. Why? Because we're supposed to be running from PIT's clutches. It'd be much more believable if we actually stirred up trouble. I suspect you have a plan. And given his admitted addiction to the rush of adrenaline, it was probably a dangerous one. He grinned again. That I have, my dear. Come along. We jogged through the darkness until we reached the start of Hardy Street. Old warehouses and rusting containers lined one side of the road. On the other were a railway line and open space, although the line currently wasn't usable because the trench had taken out a huge portion of it. On the far side of the trench, about a third of the way farther down the street, a temporary guard station had been set up. Lights constantly swept the area, and I could see at least four men. I had no doubt there were more. So what's this plan of yours? You blow the guard station up and cause some havoc, while I make my way beyond it and construct some sort of bridge. I frowned. I'm not going to hurt. I don't want you to. I just need you to distract them with some noise while I create a believable escape route. Then we retreat to the other side of Brooklyn. I raised my eyebrows. Why? Sam said this was the narrowest point. It is. But Dimitri and Adan are only a call away, and they can easily build a temporary bridge for us. They still have to get past security. No, they don't. They can reshape the earth from a distance. I hesitated and then nodded. While I wasn't entirely sure the subterfuge was worth the effort, it also went against the grain to be following PIT's orders especially when PIT was all take and no give. Right. Jackson cracked his knuckles, his anticipation burning the air. Give me twenty minutes to find what I need, then blast away. Right, I echoed. He quickly climbed the mesh fence and disappeared into the shadows of the containers beyond it. I followed him and kept close to the darkness, hugging the old warehouses until I reached the first line of the old containers. They were almost directly opposite the guard post, allowing me to keep an eye on what was happening without the risk of going too near the trench and setting off the sensors. 
five minutes passed, and two more men appeared. One patrol leg accomplished, obviously. Once the twenty-minute mark had hit, I thought, Ready? Always. I smiled and peeked around the corner of the container again. One of the guards has just entered the temporary shelter. I need you to make a slight noise, I thought. The clang of metal against metal rang across the night. My smile grew. That wasn't slight. I'm not known for doing things by halves. If you don't know that by now, we're in trouble, Jackson thought. Five of the guards immediately raced toward the sound, their weapons drawn. The sixth remained in the shelter, talking into his phone. I swore softly and targeted one of the cars instead. The explosion was impressive and loud. The five guards dove for cover as bits of metal and fire shot above their heads, and in the distance sirens began to wail. I blew up a second car, and a heartbeat later a klaxon like alarm sounded, caused by Jackson moving through the sensors, I suspected. The guards picked themselves up and raced forward. As they disappeared into the darkness, Jackson reappeared. That, he said, was fun. Now let's get the hell out of here. He twined his fingers through mine and led me away. Although the trenched-off portion of Brooklyn wasn't overly large, it nevertheless took us close to forty-five minutes to get to the opposite end of it. This was because not only did we have to contend with the military, who undoubtedly would have reported our presence had they spotted us and wasted our subterfuge efforts, but also because streets had been altered or blocked by either the cloaks or the criminals who had controlled this area before them. Eventually the strange hush of the place wrapped around us again, and we were alone in the battered remnants of what had once been a thriving community. Jackson paused as we neared the trench again, and he studied the skyline for a minute. There. He pointed to a small, double-story house. While it wasn't the only one on the street, it was one of the few that still retained its outer skin. Most of the others were little more than skeletal shells. We'll wait for the cavalry's arrival there. I raised my eyebrows. You've already called Dimitri? Yes. The old gate creaked as he opened it. And then shut down the phone. Didn't want PIT knowing we were still in the area. I followed him up the steps that bounced and groaned under our weight, an indication that this house wasn't all that far off from becoming as skeletal as the others on this street. I'm surprised you didn't toss it. Oh, I thought about it. He opened the door and waved me in. The house was an old Victorian, and as such had a central corridor from which all the rooms ran off. Stairs to the first floor on my right, with a bigger room at the end. Grime and rubbish lay everywhere, and many of the old floorboards had been torn up. The smell of smoke lingered heavily, suggesting that not too long ago someone had used the boards to feel a fire. I headed up. Things were a little better here. The floor was at least in one piece, although many of the walls had been kicked out, and either the ceiling had been pulled down, or had simply collapsed in two of the three bedrooms. I walked down to the room that overlooked the grasslands and the trench. Lights blazed from the guard stations at either end of the street. But this portion of the trench remained in shadows. I leaned a shoulder against the wall. How does Dimitri intend to get past the censors? By building a bridge that spans above both them and the trench. Jackson glanced at his watch. He said he'd be here about midnight, so not long to wait. I raised an eyebrow, a smile teasing my lips. So we're just going to stand around and watch the dust stir? Oh, I'd love to do more. Trust me on that. His tone was dry. But this is hardly the ideal time or situation. A fire fay admitting there is occasionally an inappropriate time for sex? I'm shocked. So am I. He shook his head, his expression one of mock horror. 
especially as the words are coming out of my mouth. I smiled. I'm guessing some tender ministrations will be required to remedy the situation once we get out of here. Or not so tender. His grin flashed. Because let's be honest here, the dam is so full the first release is likely to be hard and fast. My pulse skipped along happily at the thought. I think I can handle that. Good. He motioned toward the backpack. Why don't we make use of our time and see what those laptops have on them? I swung the pack from my shoulder and opened it up. After handing him two of the computers, I sat down and booted up the third. It immediately asked for a password. Fuck. Similar story here. Jackson shut down the computer and started up the last one. Ha! Better luck this time. I shoved my computer into the backpack, then scrambled over. The homepage was basic and uninspiring, and a quick look through Finder didn't reveal anything suggesting it had been used for anything more than ordering stores and chemicals. They really have removed everything remotely related to the virus. Jackson slammed the laptop lid down. And I don't think that was a wise move. Maybe they had no other option. Or maybe this particular laptop really was just used for ordering. I shrugged. PIT doesn't want Ronaldo to carry through with his threat any more than we do. I imagine there'll be remnants on the other. I stopped as my phone rang three times and then fell silent. That'll be Dmitri. Give me the phone. When I did, he hit the flashlight app, ran the bright light across the window three times, and turned it off. After shoving the two laptops into the backpack, he scrambled upright, then helped me up. Let's get the hell out of here. We rattled back down the stairs and made our way through the wreckage of the ground floor. The rear yard was tiny, the fence little more than a couple of support posts, and a few weather-worn fence posts that were barely hanging on. Once we'd slipped through the biggest gap, all that lay between the trench and us was a sea of waist-high grass and weeds. Jackson paused, his gaze narrowed and body tense. A heartbeat later, the ground shuddered ever so slightly, and up ahead a slender bridge of dirt and stone began to form. He tugged me forward. The bridge was still forming as we stepped onto it, but it arched gracefully over the trench and never once felt as if it were going to collapse underneath us. Which was rather weird, given it was also deforming, and just for a heartbeat it simply hung in the air, connected at neither end. Then we were on the other side. The bridge had become nothing but earth again, and Dmitri was striding toward us. Like Jackson, he didn't exactly fit the classic image of a fae, at least as described in literature and common myths. The earth was a solid element, and that very much described the fae who controlled it. Dmitri, like most of them, was about five foot nine and had a very stocky build, with rich brown skin and hair. The only way you could really tell any of them apart was via their facial shape and eyes. Dmitri's features were a little sharp, and his eyes the colour of burned earth. Ah, it's the lovely Emberly, he said ignoring Jackson completely as he caught my hand and kissed it. It's always a pleasure to see you. I grinned. All the Fae were outrageous flirts, even if Fire Fae were the ones who had the reputation for corrupting the innocent. Not that there was a chance of that in my case. It's lovely to see you too, Dmitri. Thanks for coming to our rescue again. It was a pleasure, my dear, and an excuse to once more gaze upon your lovely countenance. I laughed and gently pulled my fingers from his. Most fae didn't need a whole lot of encouragement to start a pursuit, and one fae was more than enough for me. If you've quite finished, Jackson said, his voice dry. We need to get away from this area before the patrols return. Did you bring the scooter? Scooter? I looked from one man to the other. You expect me to get on the back of a scooter with you two? Well, I could think of nothing more pleasurable than having you behind me. 
Dmitri said. I'm afraid it is a pleasure that is not for me. I sadly have a car. I smiled. Maybe some other time. I might just hold you to that. Jackson groaned. Now you've done it. Don't you know those of dirt and stone are akin to lava? Slow-moving but relentless. Dmitri grinned. And those of fire are quick to ignite and just as quick to wither away. My smile grew. So why do we have a Vespa rather than a car? Because Dmitri cannot be seen with us, and because no one in their right mind would choose it for a getaway, Jackson said. Therefore it is unlikely to attract much attention. So if you follow me, I will show you to your new chariot. He paused. Although I really would rather be following you. That pleasure, Jackson said, is all mine. I shook my head at their banter and followed Dmitri through the long grass. We crossed a small creek bed, then made our way across a major road toward a very familiar, and if the sudden rumblings from the general direction of my stomach were anything to go by, most welcome sign. Jackson said you might be hungry, Dmitri said, making me wonder if he'd heard my stomach. It really was that loud. And it was safe of me to park here. Less obvious. He led us through the parking area and stopped at a beautifully restored F-100. Lovely car, I said as he opened the rear door and carefully removed the Vespa. Thanks. It took me years to restore it. He placed the Vespa down, then handed Jackson the keys. I've borrowed it, so please return it in one piece. Jackson grinned. I always do. Yeah. Dmitri's droll tone suggested otherwise. He blew me a kiss, then nodded at Jackson and climbed back into his car. Seconds later he was gone, though the pleasant rumble of his car's engine seemed to echo across the darkness for a while. Jackson wheeled the Vespa closer to the main entrance. Let's grab something to eat and decide our next step. I raised an eyebrow. I thought our next step was already decided. Or have your little swimmers gone into a state of hibernation? I resent any use of the word little when it comes to my working parts. He flicked the scooter stand down and pressed a hand against my spine, guiding me forward. However, not even I could concentrate on the business of loving with the noise your stomach is making. It isn't that bad. Trust me, it is. He opened the door and ushered me through. Once we'd received our burgers, fries, and drinks, I said, Table or booth? Or would you rather leave and find somewhere close to satisfy those other urges? As much as I'd love the latter, I can't ride a Vespa and eat at the same time. And here I was thinking you were multi-talented. I started unwrapping my burger. Besides, I have two hands. I'm quite capable of holding several bags of food until we get to whatever hotel we decide on. It'd be our luck I'd take the corner too fast, and the hot drinks would go everywhere, scalding all sorts of important bits. No thanks. His smile flashed. Besides, remaining close to the trench might actually be safer than moving away from it right now. Normal people would run, not remain in the danger zone. And we're about as far from normal as you could get. I scooped up several fries, munching on them as I added. I need to get back to Rory by dawn, and it's going to take us a while on that fucking scooter. Never fear. I actually do have a car arranged. From who? Makani. Who is, he said before I could ask. A friend. One of her current lovers runs a car dealership. That's rather handy. Indeed. I did have to promise her a weekend at some posh spa resort in return for said car. But I decided the sacrifice was worth it. Oh, yeah. My tone was dry. A weekend spent in a hot tub with a hot woman will be so tough. You have no idea. He glanced at his watch. We have to meet her in an hour. Where? At the yard in... 
He stopped as my phone rang. I pulled it out of my pocket and glanced at the number. It's an office call being rerouted. Do you want me to answer it? He hesitated. No, but I've got a feeling we'd better. Your little feelings are becoming as inconvenient as mine. I hit the answer button. Emberly, a gruff and all too familiar voice said. Radcliffe. Or to give him his full title, Marcus Radcliffe III. He not only owned a string of second-hand stores that were little more than a front for a roaring trade in black market goods and information, but he also happened to be the man who ran the underground gambling operations for the Rat Shifters, operations that Ronaldo had recently attacked. What can I do for you, Radcliffe? You wanted a meet, he snapped. We do it. Right now. My stomach clenched and my gaze rose to Jackson's. He's here. The bastard's here, I thought. Yes, but it's not like he can do anything. Not with all the security cams around this place. Jackson paused. Actually, that's probably why he's ringing. We did beat him up the last time we met him, remember? He thought. It was hardly a beating. More a little singeing. I returned my attention to the phone and Radcliffe. How did you know we were here? He chuckled. It was a cold, somewhat smug sound. Rats are everywhere. There isn't much we don't see or know. Which makes it even odder you didn't stop Ronaldo's attacks on your gaming venues before they actually happened. That is the only reason I'm talking to you now, when all I really want to do is wipe the stain of your existence from this earth. My smile held very little in the way of humour. Try it, and I'll return the favour. You won't catch me out like that again. Radcliffe, Jackson cut in. Enough with the bluster. If you want to talk, come in and talk. I'll even buy you and your goons a coffee. Be there in five minutes, he said. I hung up and shoved the phone back into my pocket. Meaning he's close. Jackson nodded. He's obviously got a lair somewhere near here, and was undoubtedly keeping an eye on events in Brooklyn. Which was probably the only reason he, or his men, spotted us. PIT isn't going to be happy if we give him any sort of useful information. Jackson shrugged. It's not like we have a whole lot of useful information. At least when it comes to Ronaldo. That was true enough and part of the reason we'd asked for a meet with Radcliffe in the first place. I quickly finished my burgers, then gazed out the window, watching for the rat's appearance and wondering if he'd come in a car or walk. It was a question soon answered when three figures appeared out of the gloom and strode toward the main door. Two of them I didn't recognize, but the third was Radcliffe. He was a thick-set, muscular man, with thin, pockmarked features and an arrogant set to his mouth. His eyes were typically rat-like, small and beady, but he moved like a man who owned the world, which meant Jackson was probably right. His lair was very close to this area. Radcliffe swept in, paused until he spotted us, and then strode over. One of his men stayed near the door, but the other followed Radcliffe across, if the slight bulge in the pockets of their ill-fitting jackets was anything to go by, they were both armed. Obviously, Radcliffe hadn't yet learned guns weren't a very effective weapon when it came to phoenixes. Jackson rose and waved Radcliffe toward the booth seat. Coffee? No. Radcliffe sat with little grace and crossed his arms on the table. Anger oozed out of every pore and the gleam in his dark eyes very much suggested all he wanted to do was reach out and strangle me. Tell me what you know about Ronaldo. I raised an eyebrow and leaned back. His scent was sharp, musky, and slightly tainted with the aroma of dampness, though that seemed to be coming from his clothes rather than his skin, suggesting his lair, at least in this area, was underground. 
It made me wonder if he or his men had had any altercations with the Red Cloaks. I want a fair exchange of information, or you get nothing. Radcliffe snorted. Oh, so now you want a fair exchange. If you want to stop Ronaldo from destroying any more of your gaming venues, Jackson said, his voice hard. It would be in your best interest to help rather than hinder us. Radcliffe's gaze rose to his. I'm here. Unless you prove you are something worthwhile, you're getting nothing from me. He paused. And if you try, in any way, to burn me or my men, this entire building will come under attack. And from what I know about you, you wouldn't sleep with the blood of innocence on your hands. No, because I already had enough on them. But I kept the thought inside and let flames flicker ever so briefly across my fingers. His expression tightened. You can try such an attack, I said quietly. But I really wouldn't recommend it. Radcliffe studied me for several seconds, eyes narrowed, judging me and weighing his options. Eventually he said, I can't tell you much about Ronaldo. The man is a fucking ghost. So you have no idea where his den is? None at all. Frustration touched Radcliffe's voice. If we did... We'd have already wiped him out. Ronaldo has a dark witch working for him, so any direct attack on either him or his den is likely to be repelled by magic, Jackson said. The Syndicati think he's also using it to hide his location. Radcliffe raised an eyebrow. And you believe this? The witch certainly exists. We've met him. If you've met him... Why haven't you used him to get to Ronaldo? Better yet, why is the bastard still alive? Because he used magic to hide his form and shield himself from my flames, I said. Which is something you've apparently been looking into. Is that any fucking surprise? He snorted. But the fact that Ronaldo holds the leash of the witch does, at least, explain why we cannot find him. Which I really find odd, I said. Even if his location is being screened by magic, surely a den of vampires could not go unnoticed in a local community. Trust me, Radcliffe growled. We would have been notified if there'd been the slightest rumour of a new den. As I said, we have eyes everywhere. Meaning maybe he hasn't got a den. I glanced at Jackson. Maybe he's using hired vamps and DeLuca's get to do his dirty work. The vamps that attacked us weren't vamps for hire, Radcliffe said. Nor were they from Victoria. I glanced at him. How do you know that? His smile was all teeth and little humour. We killed a few of the bastards, that's how. And they were carrying IDs. He snorted again. Of course not. We ran a trace on their prints and got zero results. No great surprise, given no one could apparently trace Ronaldo's background either. Have there been any more attacks on your venues? I asked. No, but we did ramp up security after the last one. He paused. If he has got the services of a witch, though, we might have to do more. I doubted a witch of any standing would agree to work with Radcliffe, and those who did almost certainly wouldn't be capable of creating a spell powerful enough to withstand Frederick's magic. But I wasn't about to say that. There was no point in aggravating Radcliffe any more than necessary, especially since he was being cooperative. Surprisingly so. But it was probably a matter of his need to get rid of Ronaldo being greater than his hatred of me. We were told that Ronaldo was in charge of the most recent raid on the gaming venue. Is that true? I asked. He nodded. The security cams recorded the whole thing. The bastard was obviously aware of them, and just as obviously didn't care. His gaze narrowed slightly. Why? 
because at the same time as he was attacking your venue, he was also confronting us in Rosen Senior's apartment building. Impossible. Apparently not. I took out my phone and showed him the photograph I'd taken of Ronaldo in his Professor Heaton persona. This is him, isn't it? Radcliffe leaned forward and studied the picture for a moment. Yes. But it's impossible to be in two places at the same time unless you can clone yourself. And that isn't possible just yet. Not when it comes to humans, anyway. Cloning may not be, Jackson said. But it's more than possible that whoever he'd sent in his place when he attacked your venues was using a glamour to make it seem like he was there. The vampire who'd confronted us definitely hadn't been using one. While glamours could change your appearance, they couldn't alter your voice. The Ronaldo who'd confronted us at Rosen's was very definitely the same vampire who'd tried to grab me at the Chase Medical Research Institute, the place where I'd quite happily worked as Baltimore's research assistant before this whole mess had begun. I see no point in using a glamour in that sort of situation. But I guess we're dealing with a very old vampire. Who knows how those fuckers think? Radcliffe frowned. What were you doing at Rosen's place? Looking for Professor Wilson's missing research notes. I took a sip of tea, then added, Don't suppose you know anything about them, do you? His smile flashed. All teeth, no sincerity. I'm not likely to tell you that. Meaning, I suspected, he was as clueless as the rest of us. I doubted he would have been able to contain his smugness had it been otherwise. Would it be possible to view the tapes of the attack? No, he paused. But why would you want to? To compare that Ronaldo to the one we know, we might be able to tell more from the footage whether there was a glamour in use. He frowned. I didn't know glamours were detectable. They often weren't, but I wasn't about to tell him that. Not if lying got us those tapes. There are always tells when it comes to magic. You just have to know what to look for. Radcliffe grunted. If I give you that tape, what do I get in return? How about the file Rosen was keeping on Ronaldo? Jackson said. Whoa, I thought. Is that wise? What else have we got? he thought. We'll remove the page about the inverter, although he probably already knows about that. The inverter was a device that made the wearer immune to telepathic intrusion via an inversion process. Rosen's company had been working on it before his death. Radcliffe was more than likely already aware of the device, given he'd been bleeding Rosen of information for months, if not years, and then selling it via the black market. Although Sam had intimated that PIT had put a psychic block on Rosen in order to stop him from babbling about certain projects, so maybe not. Rosen had a file on Ronaldo. Surprise edged Radcliffe's gravelly voice. I had no idea. That's the problem with drugging someone to grab information, I said dryly. They can only supply what you ask for. The look he cast my way very definitely wasn't friendly. The tapes for the file. Agreed, I said. When and where? He hesitated, seemingly surprised, and almost immediately suspicious of my ready agreement. Your office. Tomorrow morning. We won't be there before ten. I hesitated. I also want a truce on hostilities. He laughed, a sharp sound that had heads turning. He ignored the looks and leaned forward. After what you've done to both me and my men, what makes you think I would ever agree to something like that? Because the only way any of us is going to stop Ronaldo is by working together. He snorted. Good luck getting either the Syndicati or the Wolves to agree to something like that. They already have, Jackson said. 
Or at least there's an agreement to exchange information when it comes to Ronaldo. Which wasn't exactly the truth, but Radcliffe was unlikely to check the story, given rats generally kept their dealings with vampires as brief as possible. While they did sell information and black market items to them, they certainly hadn't developed a more permanent business partnership, as Baker's Wolves had. Partly, I think, because the two had a long history of distrust that stemmed from darker times, when vamps had considered wares good hunting material. Humans might always have been a vampire's main diet, but shifters certainly proved more of a challenge for those so inclined. And rats had always been more plentiful than the larger wares. Radcliffe's gaze swept between the two of us, his expression giving a little away. If I agree to a truce, I want any and all information you might get from either Baker or the vamps. If you agree to do the same, sure. His eyes became little more than black slits. But after a moment he nodded, the motion short and sharp. He stuck his hand out. A deal shaken on is a deal that must be honoured. I gripped his hand. His grip was tight, overly so, but I resisted the urge to press more heat into my fingers. No attacks from either of us, I said, until this is over. He nodded and released my hand. Agreed. I fought the desire to wipe the stain of his touch away on my jeans, and simply watched as he rose. Tomorrow at ten, he said, and then walked away. Jackson waited until all three had left, then sat down and reached for his coffee. That went better than expected. Yeah. I drained my tea in one long gulp. I'm not sure we should trust the bastard, though. They'll stick to the terms agreed, Jackson said. He can't afford not to, particularly in this case. I glanced at him curiously. It sounds as if you've had some dealings with him. Not Radcliffe specifically, but I've certainly dealt with rats on a few occasions. He shrugged. As Radcliffe said, there's not much that goes on that the rats don't see or know about. I frowned. Is it possible Ronaldo has rats working for him? It might explain why they haven't been able to trace him, and why Radcliffe got no warning about the attacks. Radcliffe's lair might be the most powerful in the city, but it's certainly not the only one, Jackson said. It is more than possible one of the smaller lairs has decided to work with Ronaldo in order to destroy Radcliffe and take his lair's position. I didn't know rats were so competitive. I thought they all just basically stuck to their own territories. Regular rats tend to. But we're talking rat shifters here, and that comes with all the usual human vices, such as greed and desire. Jackson's voice was dry. And I'm not talking sexual desire. I raised an eyebrow, a smile teasing my lips. You're not. That would have to be a first. Indeed. He glanced at his watch. If we leave now, we'll have just enough time to go grab the car... And then, my dear Emily, we can discuss the notion of desire to our heart's content. I'd rather do than discuss. He grinned. An even better idea. Shall we go? I rose and followed him out the door. After donning one of the helmets attached to the Vespa, I climbed on behind Jackson and lightly held onto his hips as he started the thing and drove off. And although it wasn't a particularly powerful machine, there was still something very pleasant about riding through the dead of night, with the stars bright overhead and the wind cool against my skin. It took us about twenty minutes to get across to the car yard. Jackson pulled into the parking area and stopped. In the brief moment of silence, a car door slammed, and then a woman appeared. She was tall and slim, with silvery white hair and the most amazing blue eyes I'd ever seen. It wasn't just the colour, which was a blue as rich as a summer sky, but rather the sense of otherworldliness that hit the minute my gaze met hers. It was almost as if I were staring at someone who wasn't simply flesh, 
but something far greater. Something ethereal and powerful. Air Fay, that inner voice whispered. Emberly, Jackson said. Meet our saviour, the lovely Makani. She raised a silvery eyebrow, her expression amused. Have you ever noticed he's so much more generous with his compliments when he's after something? She held out her hand. It's a pleasure to meet you, Emberly. The minute my skin touched hers, the air stirred, and just for a moment it seemed to be filled with whispers. They weren't ones I could understand. But she could. Her eyes widened fractionally as she ever so gently disentangled her grip from mine. What did you see? I asked. She hesitated, her expression briefly uncertain. Trouble and darkness, but also glimmers of hope. Air Fay, Jackson said, his tone dry. I rather like witches. They cannot abide speaking in simple, understandable terms. Makani elbowed him. Shut up and give me your hand. He raised an eyebrow but did as she bid. She cocked her head to one side, obviously listening to the voices I now couldn't hear. Eventually she sighed and released him. It would appear your fates have been tied together. And you, my dear friend, have stepped well away from the path fate initially mapped out for you. Meaning the death your father saw for me no longer applies, he asked. If he was at all concerned by this prospect, I wasn't sensing it. She hesitated again. I believe not. But we're reaching a time of flux, and you two are going to be right in the middle of it. So we've been warned before, I said. She nodded. By both Lan and Grace, I believe. Surprise ran through me. Lan was the old Filipino shaman who'd helped us stop the Aswang, the spider spirit who'd been using her victims as fodder for her young. He'd also given us a rather dire warning, that a time of metaphysical darkness was approaching Melbourne, and it was a darkness that would draw even darker creatures and events. The Aswang and the virus were, apparently, just the beginning of our troubles. I'm surprised you know them. I thought Air Fay tended to be soloists, I said. While it is true we generally don't mix with shaman and witches, all of us who read the future, be it through Earth or the air, have felt this period of flux coming for a while now. She shrugged. It has forced us to unite and discuss the matter. And have said discussions led to a possible solution to the problem? Jackson asked. Or have you all taken the politician's path? Lots of rhetoric and little action. She elbowed him again, this time hard enough to draw a grunt. I'll give you lots of rhetoric and little action next time you want to get lusty, if you're not damn well careful. I grinned. The little I'd seen of Air Fay had made me believe they were all delicate, somewhat fragile beings, who often weren't grounded in any way. But it seemed that belief was very wrong, at least when it came to Makani. Both Lan and Grace were rather vague on what this flux might entail, I said. I don't suppose you can clarify it any. She was shaking her head even before I'd finished asking the question. Not even my father can see that, and he has been reading fate for nearly a millennium now. I blinked. Even for a fae, that was old. All any of us can do is monitor the situation and provide support for those on the front line when and where needed. Meaning us, I'm gathering. Yes. A smile touched her lips. I also believe, in the very near future, that you will need the services of a good secretary, capable of providing mystical support. And you're volunteering, Jackson said. Most excellent. Well, it was either me or Lan, 
and as much as I admire the shaman, he wouldn't be able to put up with your bullshit for long. She gave him a somewhat severe look, though amusement lurked in the depths of her blue eyes. There will, however, be no fraternization during work hours. He groaned. That is nothing short of torture times two. Fate obviously has it in for me this decade. Makani raised an eyebrow as she glanced at me. You already have this rule. It's a very sensible one, given the amorous tendencies of the Fae in question, I said. It'd be hard to get any work done without it. Indeed. While those of fire do rank rather high on the overly sex scale, I rather suspect this one stood in line twice. Ladies, I am standing right next to you both. Indeed, Makani repeated, her amusement stronger. She reached into her coat pocket, pulled out a set of keys and offered them to me. It's the black SUV at the back of the lot. It's got full insurance, but please try not to make too much of a mess of it. My fingers brushed hers as I took the keys, and again the whispers swirled. Her eyes went wide. What? I immediately said. You need to get back to your partner. Now. Chapter 7 Fear stepped into my heart. I didn't say anything. I didn't even question her. I simply wrapped my fingers around the keys and ran for the back of the lot. Open the rear cargo, Jackson said. I pressed the appropriate button on the remote, then pulled off the backpack containing the laptops and threw it onto the back seat. Jackson dumped the Vespa into the cargo area, then climbed into the passenger seat. I was reversing out of the bay even before he'd closed the door. Makani was still standing where we'd left her, her arms crossed and her expression troubled. She raised a hand as we sped past. I didn't acknowledge it. I didn't dare take my hands off the wheel, given the speed at which we were already moving. It'll be okay. Don't, I said, my voice sharp, and then took a deep breath, trying to calm down. Sorry, I shouldn't be snapping at you. He reached across the center console and squeezed my leg. It's okay, Em. We're connected, remember? And wouldn't you feel it if he was dead? Normally, yes. But Rory's still in a weak state, and that could hinder our connection and my ability to call to his ashes. So there's a distance restriction when it comes to that sort of thing? Like any signal that has no amplification, it grows weaker the farther you move away from the primary source. So you'd never risk going interstate or overseas without him? No, I couldn't anyway. We need to reaffirm our connection on a regular basis. He grunted. Fate really has gotten in for your lot, hasn't it? Our life isn't bad, Jackson. It can just get complicated. To say the least. He shook his head. I think I'd rather juggle a hundred women than do what you and Rory do century after century. I glanced at him. Even you can't juggle a hundred women. He raised an eyebrow. Want to bet on it? I laughed. No, I do not. I swung the SUV onto the freeway ramp and hit the accelerator, reaching for every ounce of speed the Range Rover had. As the big engine kicked into gear, he said, If Makani does come to work with us, she won't want to just be a secretary. She'll want to be a full partner. He was, I knew, talking to keep my mind off what might be happening with Rory. I have no problem with that, but I am surprised. She's an air fay, and they're even less inclined to remain around cities than your lot. I suspect she's been sent here by her father. I raised an eyebrow and glanced at him. I didn't think any of the fay remained in family groups. We don't. But both parents always remain a part of any child's life no matter how young or old that child is. Meaning they were a whole lot better than we phoenixes at keeping in contact once their children had flown the nest. I was under the impression you hadn't talked to your dad for years. I haven't. 
but I'm also much older than Makani. Besides, given how long we live, years are more like months. Just how much older are you? He grinned. When you tell me your true age, I'll tell you mine. Fair enough. I concentrated on overtaking a long truck for a minute, and then added, What makes you think her dad sent her here? Because I certainly hadn't gained that impression by anything she'd said or done in our brief meeting. It was something she said when I first contacted her, that she'd been expecting my call. I frowned. She's Air Fay. That goes with the territory, doesn't it? Yes, but Makani stepped away from reading the wind after the death of a lover some years back. Meaning she read the wind wrong? Quite the opposite. He wouldn't listen to her. Meaning he was an idiot. Did he know she was Fay? A smile touched his lips. He was Fay. And he was also the one who read the wind wrong, not her. He died. She discovered two weeks later that she was carrying his child. I swung onto the Hume freeway ramp, keeping the big vehicle in line as we took the sweeping turn far faster than the sign recommended. That would have been hard. Yeah. Jackson was silent for a moment, and then added, Makani stepped away from reading the wind the minute she discovered that. I frowned. I would have thought she'd do the opposite to keep her child safe. Reading is not without its risks. There have been instances of Fisihech losing all sense of self and becoming little more than air. Fisihech, I knew, was basically the fey term for shaman. If she'd been one, then she was a very gifted reader indeed. So if she's once again doing so, it's because she's been asked. When he nodded, I added, But why would her dad ask her, rather than simply do it himself? Because the older the fae get, the more stretched they become, until they are so thin they appear little more than gossamer. He wouldn't have the strength to counter whatever events this so-called flux is going to throw at us. I'm seriously doubting he intends Makani to actually fight. No, but she's a fae in the prime of her life, and she'll be able to withstand the exchange of forests for the bleakness of the city far longer than he. And her child? He is now in his thirties, and in training to become Fisahich when his grandfather eventually dies. So it's a position that's handed down? Jackson nodded. But generally to the male in the line, not the female. So she was training because there were no sons? Yes. But to become Fisahich is to forgo children. He obviously didn't. Nor did Makani, for that matter. Makani was conceived before he stepped into the position. I have no doubt Harvo will have done the same now that he is undergoing the training. As for Makani, she also stepped away from training simply because she wanted to spend more time with her son than the position would have allowed. Ha! Huh. I concentrated on the road for a while, and eventually asked... Do you have any problems with working with her? He shook his head. She'll be an asset. Not to mention easy on the eyes. Remember the no-touching rule? Oh, trust me, I'm remembering. The swimmers are aching at the mere thought of it. I grinned. They will get relief, eventually. I'll probably explode before then. His expression was gloomy, but amusement teased his lips. At this rate, I'll have to take matters into my own hands, and that's a very depressing thought. I chuckled softly. I'm sure you're more than capable of such an action, even if it is a very foreign one for you. He sniffed, a sound that somehow managed to be disdainful. The point is I shouldn't have to. My amusement grew, but I resisted the urge to reach across and pat his leg in sympathy. Not only would that have been dangerous, given the speed we were going, but also because I knew he really was sexually frustrated. I could feel the heat of it running through the back of my thoughts, a river of desire that could so easily sweep me away if I wasn't very careful. 
And right now, with everything going on, we really couldn't afford that happening. If he heard that particular thought, he didn't reply to it. Maybe the reality of it simply depressed him too much. I drove on into the night. Luckily, there didn't seem to be any cops about, and even if there had been, I wouldn't have stopped. The need to get back to Rory, to see what was happening, was beating fast and strong within me. And while I was now close enough to know that he wasn't dead, that didn't mean he wasn't injured or close to that state. I needed to know, needed to get there and find out. As I swung onto the dirt road that led down to the river and our cabin, flashes of red and blue began to cut through the trees. Not from flames, but from emergency vehicle lights. My heart began to race a whole lot faster, even though I still had no sense that Rory was dead. A police car blocked the road near the first cabin, forcing me to stop. I did so and rolled down the window. I'm sorry, miss, the officer said. But there's been a fire and we're not... We're PIT associates. Jackson leaned past me to give the officer his badge. And we've been called in to investigate. The officer frowned as his gaze swept the badge. I can't see why PIT would even be here, let alone send associates. Emberly here was staying in one of the cabins, Jackson said. What building went up? And have there been any injuries or fatalities? It was the last cabin, and yes, there have been injuries. We're still trying to determine the latter. I briefly closed my eyes and fought the urge to run into the area and find Rory. If he were dead, I'd know. I had to cling to that, if nothing else. We need to get in there, officer. Now. Jackson added when the officer hesitated. Wait here while I check with the inspector. He stepped back and began talking into his two-way. I tapped my fingers against the steering wheel, my gaze on the lights up ahead. Smoke swelled through the night, but I couldn't see any flames, and there was little in the way of heat riding the crisp air. Okay, the officer said, handing Jackson's ID back. You're cleared, but you'll have to leave the SUV here. Just pull it off the road a bit more. I did so, then grabbed my coat and climbed out. The farther I got down the road, the stronger the scent of smoke became. One of our neighbours nodded at me as we strode by, and the cabin nearest ours bore scorch marks. That fact alone suggested our cabin hadn't just caught fire, it had exploded. I rounded the corner and was met by a scene of utter destruction— there was little left of the cabin but a pile of smouldering wood. Even the old stone chimney hadn't withstood the explosion. There were only a few bricks left at the base to indicate its existence. We were stopped again as we drew near the cabin, but once we'd both shown our IDs, we were motioned over to a somewhat dishevelled-looking gentleman, whose short grey hair stuck out in all directions, and who seemed to be wearing a striped pyjama top under his sweater. Inspector James Cobden, he said, his voice gruff but not unfriendly. What's PIT's interest in this case? I introduced us both, then added, I was staying here with a friend. If his name is Rory Jones, he's currently being checked by the ambulance crew, the inspector said. Can you think of any reason why someone might have wanted to harm either of you? Relief swept me and I didn't bother hiding it. PIT isn't well-liked, even among our fellow officers. Do you mind if I head over to talk to my companion? I'll stay here and answer any questions you might have, Jackson said, even as he gave me a light push toward the ambulance. I didn't really need the encouragement, and walked away before the inspector could answer. Rory was sitting on the back of the ambulance, his right arm being bandaged by a paramedic, and his hair somewhat singed, both of which suggested he'd been unable to draw in the fire and stop it from affecting him for some reason. He was wearing a pair of old jeans and a shirt that hung like a tent on him, but his feet were bare and blackened with soot. The paramedic glanced up as I approached. I flashed my badge, then sat beside Rory. 
You okay? Yeah, close call, though. He put his free hand between us, and I placed mine on top. Though there was no telltale spark or heat, he instantly began drawing on my strength. He was weaker, far weaker than when we'd left him, which basically confirmed that he'd been the reason the cabin had exploded. Not that I'd really had much doubt about that. The only other way the cabin could have gone up like that was if the gas bottles had exploded. What happened? Break-in of some kind that went wrong. He shrugged, a casual move that was anything but. Tension and anger rode him, but the paramedic's presence was preventing him from saying anything. It's just lucky I happen to be in the bathroom. It probably saved me from the explosion. Who broke in? Any idea? He glanced at me, his amber eyes a glitter, but he said only, No, that's a job for the coroner, if he can find anything left of them in the ashes, that is. Meaning he'd made damn sure nothing was left. And the clothes? A smile ghosted his lips. A donation from the guy two doors up. Told me it wasn't right to be walking around buck naked when there were kiddies about. I raised my eyebrows. There are kids here? I don't remember seeing any. That's because said kiddies are actually teenagers, who were very unimpressed by the term. I can imagine. Right, the paramedic said as he finished bandaging Rory's arm. The painkiller I gave you should hold for a couple of hours, but you might need something after that. You should go to the hospital, in my opinion. A smile ghosted Rory's lips. I'm a firefighter. The boys would give me merry hell if I went to the hospital for a burn as minor as this. Partial second-degree burns are hardly minor. The paramedic's expression was disapproving. Sounds like your workmates are a bunch of idiots. Their teasing is simply a way of relieving tension, Rory said, his tone a little sharp. You should know that. The paramedic grunted and stepped back. Given you won't take my advice, you're free to go. Rory released me and rose, somewhat cautiously, to his feet. I stood with him, one hand near his elbow, ready to catch him should he show any sign of toppling. After a minute, his smile flashed, and he pointed with his chin toward the somewhat blackened trunk of an old river gum to the right of the cabin ruins. Once there, he sat down and released a somewhat shuddering breath. Well, that was a fucking interesting night. I glanced around to make sure no one was close enough to overhear us. What actually happened? As I said, I was attacked. But I certainly wasn't in the bathroom at the time. The fury I'd glimpsed before was fully evident now. The bastards came equipped with magic. Fuck, what sort? The sort that restrains our access to fire, but not our access to the mother. The smile that touched his lips was cold. Very cold. They found that out very fast. Which explained why he was so drained. Reaching for the mother when he was still in the recovery stage of rebirth had been a very dangerous thing to do. I twined my fingers around his again, needing the comfort of his touch. I could have so very easily lost him, because there would have been no calling him back. Not from the mother. Any idea who they were? Well, they were very definitely vampires. Other than that, no. I frowned. DeLuca's get has come after me and Jackson a few times now, but I can't see why they'd drive all the way out here to attack you. Besides, how would they even know you exist? I was at High Point when Perella shot DeLuca, remember? Maybe one of his crew mentioned it to them. I wrinkled my nose. Even if that were true, Perella and his people couldn't possibly have known about the connection between us. Maybe it's simply a matter of the Den wanting to erase anyone connected to you. Maybe, I said, even as doubt gnawed at me. While it wasn't beyond the realm of possibility that DeLuca's get had indeed decided to erase anyone I was close to, I doubted they'd have either the funds or the foresight to go to a witch and purchase a restraining spell. 
not now that their creator was dead. If they were vampires, they must have driven up here. Did you hear a vehicle of any kind? Rory shook his head. The police suspect they parked it in the scrub farther up the road and walked in. I frowned. Suspect? Meaning they haven't found it yet? Not that I've heard, but they're not likely to tell me even if they had. He paused and reached into the pocket of his borrowed jeans. I did manage to grab a couple of wallets before I cindered the bastards. I took the two of them, then dropped one onto my knees and opened the other. There were a couple of credit cards bearing the name Harry Jones, and a driver's license that apparently belonged to a Stephen White. I flipped it around so Rory could see the ID picture. Is that one of the vamps? He studied the picture for a moment, then shook his head. But it's not really surprising they'd be holding stolen IDs. Most vamps who take a commission don't carry anything that could accurately identify them. What makes you think the attack was a commission? I opened the second wallet and discovered another credit card and driver's license, bearing different names, although this time both were female. Rory shook his head again when I showed it to him. It's just a feeling I got. They weren't moving as a team, but rather separate entities. It was almost as if they were racing each other to get the kill. He hesitated, then half laughed, although it was a sound that held little in the way of amusement. That haste was probably the only thing that saved me. You heard them coming? Not initially. But one of them disengaged the safety as he was coming at me, rather than doing it outside. It was only a soft click, but it was so out of place that it was enough to wake me. I frowned. If they had guns, why didn't they just shoot the shit out of the cabin? They would have known your position by the sound of your heartbeat. Aside from the fact it would have woken the entire neighborhood, you mean? I half smiled. Yes. He shrugged. Good question, and one I can't possibly answer given the state of both the cabin and my five attackers. He disentangled his fingers from mine. If I drain any more of your strength, you're going to be as weak as me. In any other circumstance, I would have protested. But he was right. The simple fact was my reserves were already riding too low. We need to find somewhere else for you to recover in safety. If they found this place, they're bound to find any other location we decide on. Not necessarily, Jackson said as he walked over, and then squatted down in front of us. Tell me, just how the hell did you, of all people, get burned? A smile ghosted Rory's lips. I forgot about the gas bottles on the side of the cabin when I incinerated the place. Their explosion sent me tumbling, and it tore me from spirit to flesh form. But even then, the fire shouldn't have affected you, Jackson said. There were witnesses by that stage. I did stop the fire burning too deeply, but I could hardly walk out of a firestorm completely untouched, not without raising all sorts of suspicions. Jackson grunted and glanced at me. The cops told me there's no unaccounted car in the area. The vamps must have been dropped off. Which means they'll probably have a pickup arranged. He nodded. I told the cop we'd position ourselves up near the main road and nab anyone who comes down here. Did you now? He ignored the sarcasm in my voice. And I also have a solution to the accommodation issue. Let me guess, I said. You've volunteered the home of one of the ladies from your harem. Well, no, because I really don't want to put any more of them in any sort of danger. I was thinking more along the lines of Adan. Adan being the second Earth Fae who'd helped create the trench around Brooklyn. Really? Why? Because he not only lives in Thornton, which is only about fifty minutes from here, but his home is something of a fortress. I wrinkled my nose. Fifty minutes adds a whole lot to our travelling time when we're in the city. But you don't have to come back to me every night, Em, Rory said. I may still be weak, 
that as long as I've got fire, I'll be all right for a couple of days. I don't know. The real problem, Rory said, cutting me off with a gentle squeeze of my arm, is that if they found this place, they're more than likely to find others. And I'd hate to put a darn in any sort of danger. Jackson snorted. Her darns and earth fay. Trust me, those buggers don't scare easily, and they certainly don't die easily. He'll jump at the opportunity for some action. I did believe him, because he'd already done just that when we'd called both him and Dmitri to help us in Brooklyn. Maybe what we need is a little subterfuge. Like what? Jackson asked. Well, there are only two ways those vamps could have found this place. Either they were tracking us... We checked the cars regularly. We weren't bugged, Jackson said. There's more than one way to track, Rory said. Winged shifters, for instance. PIT was certainly using hawk shifters to tail us, Jackson said. But I was under the impression they'd stopped. I snorted. Just because the inspector implied that doesn't mean she actually did it. I liked the woman, but she was in the middle of a battle she couldn't afford to lose, and there was no doubt in my mind she'd do whatever she deemed necessary to twist the odds in her favour. If that included following two people who were knee-deep in the same shit, then she'd do so. And if we weren't followed, I continued, then the only other way they could have found us is if they were told. Rory frowned. Did you tell anyone we were here? No. Jackson held up his hands. Don't look at me. Which means they either had psychic help, or PIT did indeed track us here, and the squad does indeed have a mole. There's an easy way to get an answer to one of those questions. Jackson pulled out his phone and hit the dial button, then held the phone between the three of us so we could all hear. Chief Inspector! he said the minute she answered. I have a rather urgent question for you. Indeed. Please proceed. Have you set a hawk on our tail? She paused. And if I have? You need to call him off. Only if you start carrying your phone so we know your location. It's imperative that we keep track of all operatives right now. Inspector, I cut in. We're not operatives. We're associates, and your tracking us almost led to the death of a friend. Would this friend be Rory Jones, the man nobody witnessed coming out of Brooklyn? I hesitated. The same. Care to explain how he got out? No, and that's not important right now, I said. Are you or are you not having us tailed? I am. Then you need to call them off. Someone betrayed our position, Inspector. There is no leak or mole in my department, Pearson. Her tone was frosty. If your hideout was blown, then it was not due to anything we did. No one knew where we were, Inspector. There were no bugs in our cars, and we dumped Jackson's phone long before we got to our current location. The Syndicati are not averse to using winged shifters to follow targets the inspector said. Yes, but we would have noticed two birds following us, and undoubtedly your hawk would also have noticed another tag. I hesitated. Besides, we have a truce with Perella. He wouldn't be following us. Not by air at any rate, Jackson thought. Not if the past efforts are anything to go by. If you believe that, the inspector said, then you are both fools. Maybe we were. Maybe it was the Syndicati behind all this, given it was vampires who attacked Rory. But that little voice inside me, the one that dreamed of death and was very rarely wrong, suggested PIT was somehow connected. It wasn't behind the actual attack. Of that I had no doubt. But the information about our location had certainly come from the organization. Somehow. Inspector, Jackson said. If you can guarantee with 100% certainty that PIT is secure and has no leaks, then I'll keep my phone 
and even tell you where we'll be staying. But call off the hawks, because the next time we spot one following us, we'll fry it. I would advise against doing that. I really don't appreciate my people coming under friendly fire. Her voice was flat. Where are you staying? I'll tell you that when we decide where to go next. Thanks, Inspector. With that, he hung up. There's only one way we're going to prove whether PIT is a leak, and that's by exposing it. That could get dangerous, Rory said. Not if we're sneaky about it. A smile touched Rory's lips. I didn't think sneaky was in a fire phase vocabulary. We generally do prefer to be upfront about things, but hey, needs must and all that. Jackson plucked one of the wallets from my hand. And I'm thinking these could provide access to sneakiness. I smiled. So we booked two rooms at a hotel, using the stolen credit cards for the second one. Then leave your phone in one, and keep watch from the other. It's almost as if you read my mind. His grin flashed. Then we give the inspector the address, and see what happens. And if nothing does, it might at least mean PIT is secure. Exactly. But it might take a few days for someone to bite, so we'll have to be careful about coming and going. It's also probably best if I visit Rory alone. Agreed. Jackson rose. I'll go see if Cobden is happy to release Rory, then make calls to both Perella and Adan. Then we can head up to the main road to keep an eye on things, while we wait for Adan to arrive. I really doubt anyone will be back to retrieve the vampires. They must know something has gone wrong by now. Oh, I agree. But we've got nothing to lose. Jackson shrugged, then spun around and walked away. I glanced at Rory. Are you sure you're going to be okay? You're still on the wire when it comes to strength. So are you. He brushed his fingertips down my cheek. I'll be okay. Just don't get yourself killed when there's such a distance between us, because that might be problematic. Trust me, I'm doing my best to avoid getting dead. Good. He hesitated. What happened in Brooklyn? I gave him a quick update on everything. Rory frowned. If he is using magic to hide his location, why haven't the witches discovered it? Surely using that much power would have caused some ripples in the Earth's energy fields. So I would have thought. But maybe he's not using much. Maybe the spell is just big enough to conceal Ronaldo's presence and nothing else. Which would suggest he hasn't a den of his own. At least not yet. Rory paused. It could also mean he's using the Coalition to hire people. If that's true, then maybe tonight's attack came from him. The Coalition's full name was the Coalition of Non-Humans. It was an independent resource centre that provided financial and legal help to both vampires and werewolves, and it was mostly funded by member contributions. The CNH tended to be low-key, not only because of the rise of anti-werewolf and vampire sentiment in recent years, but also because it had a smaller, less known, but very profitable, side department. This department basically handled non-human business activities that were not only more than a little illegal, but which required anonymity. Things like kidnapping and killing. It had no official phone number and couldn't be reached via the CNH's switchboard. If you wanted something done, or if you wanted to contact someone you might have dealt with previously, the only way to do so was via snail mail. Which was what we'd done a few days ago. We'd sent a letter requesting to meet with Lee Rawlings, the coalition bagman who'd been sent to collect me the first time I'd been kidnapped. We'd been hoping that he'd been able to tell us more about the state of play between the Syndicati factions, and maybe even Luke. But we'd since uncovered a lot of that information ourselves. It'd still be handy to talk to him, though, 
if only because he might have some information about Ronaldo. The bastard might be off radar, but surely someone, somewhere, had to know something about him. It's possible. But I don't see why Ronaldo would go to such lengths, I said. Besides, Radcliffe had said the vamps who attacked his venues weren't mercenaries. If they'd come from the coalition, they would have been. Remember, you're talking about a very old vampire. In his mind, I'm probably nothing more than an incomplete lesson. Until I stay taken out, said lesson would have little impact. I could totally see Ronaldo thinking that way, especially given what he'd done to Shona and the wolves. Which means if he does discover your new location, you and Adan will come under attack. From the little I've seen of Adan, I wish them luck trying. Rory patted my leg. Stop worrying and help me up. I did so. Thankfully, he was a little more secure on his feet this time. But I still hovered close as we made our way over to where Jackson stood talking to Cobden. You're free to go, he said. Just remain reachable in case we have any further questions. My phone has been destroyed, Rory said. But you can get hold of me via either Emberley's work number or Jackson's. Cobden nodded and stepped away. We walked back to the car, then drove it along the old road and pulled into the trees just off the main road. Any success with Perella? I asked Jackson. He denies the use of winged shifters to tag us, and he didn't order the hit. He didn't, however, rule out the possibility of that happening in the future if we didn't start relaying more information. Hard to relay what we haven't got. And the stuff we did have, we certainly didn't want in their hands. I did say that. He didn't believe we don't have the information. And Adan? I asked. Reckons he'll be here by four, Jackson said. I'll keep an eye on things if you two want a nap. I didn't argue. I just settled more comfortably into the seat and went straight to sleep. The slamming of a car door jerked me awake. I sat upright too quickly and just about strangled myself on the seatbelt as it snapped taut. I swore, released the thing, then scrubbed the sleep from my eyes and peered through the somewhat foggy windshield. Jackson was greeting another man who would have been an almost identical replica of Dimitri, if not for the shape of his face and nose, both of which were broader. Rory, I said. A dance here. I climbed out of the car without waiting for a response, crossing my arms and shivering a little as the chilly night air hit like a slap across the face. A grin split Adan's lips when he spotted me, and his eyes, a warm chocolate colour, gleamed with pleasure. And, I suspected, more than a little desire. But then he was Fay. It's a real pleasure to see you again. He caught my hand, tugged me closer, and kissed both my cheeks. I do so hope having Rory stay at my place means you will come visit me. If you're cooking, I'll be there. Excellent. His gaze moved past me. That's a rather becoming outfit you're wearing there, Rory. Oversized and ill-fitting are the next new trend. His tone was dry. I appreciate your taking me in on short notice like this. Adan's grin widened. Although Jackson assures me there shouldn't be any problems, I'm always up for a good fight. You ready? Rory nodded, then gave me a wink and followed Adan across to his Land Rover. Once they were gone, I said, We need to find somewhere to rest, but I doubt there'll be many hotels open at this hour. Not in this area, anyway. No. Jackson scrubbed a hand through his hair. For the first time since I'd known him, he actually looked tired. Why don't we just head back to the office? We need to make arrangements for Ronaldo to pick up the laptops. And we have to be there to meet Radcliffe at ten, anyway. I frowned. That's an hour and a half drive, 
I'm not sure either of us can do it. Well, it's either that or we sleep in the SUV. Let's do the drive. The Range Rover was a comfortable beast, but nothing could beat a real bed. It was a long drive back to Melbourne, but our wakefulness was boosted by several coffee stops along the way. The office remained as we'd last left it, and was as cold as hell, but I didn't care. I stripped as I headed up the circular staircase, and all but fell onto the mattress. Jackson had stopped downstairs to make a call to Ronaldo, and I have no memory of him joining me in the bed. I was already asleep by that time. A harsh rapping woke me some hours later. I sat upright, my heart hammering, for an instant confused as to where I was. The sun was shining in through the big window to my right, highlighting the mess that surrounded us, a mess caused by vamps searching both the office and this upper living area. The rapping echoed again, and I scrubbed a hand across my eyes and glared, somewhat blearily at the clock. Ten o'clock. Oh, fuck. Jackson, get up! I scrambled out of the bed. The rats are here! Too early, he mumbled. Come back to bed. I tossed his jeans at his face. It's ten. Is the file still behind the coffee machine? Yes. He swung out of bed and began climbing into his jeans. You get the door. I'll get the file and remove the appropriate bits. As we clattered down the stairs, someone leaned on the doorbell and let it ring long and loud. All right, all right, I'm coming, I shouted back, doing up my shirt as I walked, albeit slowly, over to the door. I took my time undoing the bolts, but left the chain on as I opened the door a fraction and peered out. You were the one who set the time, Radcliffe said, clearly amused. If it was inconvenient, you should have said. Sorry, it's been a long night. Hang on. I closed the door again and glanced across at Jackson. He nodded and fired up the coffee machine. I undid the chain and opened the door wider. Come on in. Radcliffe stopped several steps in, his gaze sweeping the mess and the remains of the chalky outline of where Rosen's body had been dumped. I think you need to change your decorator, because this isn't a look that would garner any sort of respect from clients. He was, it seemed, in a rather jovial mood. Given both he and his goons were wearing expensive-looking suits, it was highly likely he'd come straight from the casino and a rather nice win. Radcliffe might run underground gaming venues, but he certainly didn't spend his cash there, undoubtedly because he knew just how rigged the games were. Rats weren't generous souls, and if the rumours I'd heard were true, his gaming venues were profit-generating machines— which was undoubtedly why Ronaldo wanted to take them over. I waited until his two goons had entered, then closed the door. You got the tape? He glanced at one of his men, who reached into his pocket and produced it. You got the file? Jackson picked it up from the coffee table and walked across. There's not a whole lot of information in it, but it does state Ronaldo's first name is Reginald, and that he arrived in Melbourne three years ago. Wonder how Rosen uncovered that when the rest of us can't get squad against the man. Radcliffe opened the file and flicked through. Not much, as you said, but more than we'd previously had. The deal proceeds. Good. I paused. How do we make contact if we find anything else? Radcliffe produced a card. It's a messenger service, but any call you make will be treated as a priority. I accepted the card and tucked it into my shirt pocket. We expect the same sort of courtesy. You can use the office number. Excellent. But I'm not leaving without the tape as I have no desire for it to land in P.I.T.'s hands. View it, and tell me what you see. I glanced at Jackson, who shrugged minutely. 
Can't see the harm, he thought. I tossed it to him. He walked across to the desk, switched on the computer, and then slipped the tape into the attached player. A second later, images began to scroll across the screen. The tape had clearly been edited, because the action started almost immediately. Unsurprisingly, Ronaldo and his men were the poster boys of efficient brutality, and the gaming venue was theirs in a matter of minutes. Play it back at half speed. I pulled the chair closer and sat down. Jackson did so. If he's using a glamour to hide his form, it's a damn good one. What makes you say that? Radcliffe said. He was standing behind us, and his nearness was making my spine itch. We might have a truce, but I still wasn't trusting it would hold up against his desire to slip a knife into my back. A glamour usually can't withstand any sort of touch. No matter how perfect it is from either a distance or close up, if it brushes against either an object or a person, there is a telltale shimmer. I pointed at the screen. But if you watch carefully, when Ronaldo snaps the neck of your security guard, there's no such shimmer. This is him. It's not someone else using a glamour. Which means, Jackson said, Ronaldo might, in fact, be two people, rather than one. Turn up the sound, I said. He did so, and we listened to Ronaldo barking orders and threats. It's not the same voice. The tone is slightly different. Jackson nodded. Yeah, it is. I swore and leaned back in the chair. Well, this just makes things all the more difficult. Not really, Jackson said. The only thing that's changed is that we're now hunting two people, not one. It does at least explain how we can be in two places at once, Radcliffe said. And surely there can't be too many identical twin vampires turned in the last few hundred years. Ronaldo's a very ancient vampire, I said. The Council isn't likely to have a record of him. That may be true of the Australian branch, Radcliffe said. But I'm betting their European counterparts might be a little more helpful. I swung around to look at him. You have contacts over there? His smile flashed. I have contacts everywhere. I resisted the urge to smite the smug look from his face. Then contact them. We'll see if PIT can dig up anything. They may be able to, Jackson thought. Whether they'll actually tell us anything is a totally different thing. That could be said about Radcliffe, too, I thought back. He might be emitting all the right signals when it came to being cooperative, but I doubted it would last if he actually got a worthwhile lead on our vampire. I very much suspected Radcliffe would not, in any way, share his chance of retribution. Deal, Radcliffe said. Talk to you soon. With that, he collected his tape and strode to the door, one goon in front, the other behind. The latter did not shut the door after him. Pricks, I muttered as I pushed up and walked across to lock up again. Jackson's arm slid around my waist as I slammed the deadbolt home. I'm thinking we finally have a few moments to ourselves, he murmured, his warm breath teasing my left ear. Care to spend them relieving a mild ache or two? I spun around and draped my arms around his neck. Mild tension? Does that mean you actually took care of business while I was asleep? He laughed. No, it most certainly does not. But stating the obvious, that I'm going to explode if I don't get inside you soon, sounded a little crude. Since when has that stopped you? I do occasionally like to surprise people, you know. What time did you tell Ronaldo to drop by and pick up the laptops? This afternoon, when we're not here. Shame you didn't say ten. It would have given Radcliffe his chance at killing the bastard. Ronaldo is hardly likely to come here himself, 
given he's well aware we have a deal going with the Syndicati. He pressed me tighter against his groin. And can we change the topic? Talking about those two is seriously deflating. I smiled. If anything was deflating, I sure as hell wasn't feeling it. Well, that can't be allowed to happen. What can I do to fix it? Kiss me. Even as he said it, his lips came down upon mine, hard. As kisses went, it was glorious, all passion and need and urgency. It drew me in and swept me away, until I couldn't think of anything more than him and me, and the desire that threatened to burn out of control between us. Eventually he pulled away, his breathing harsh and unsteady. He didn't say anything. He simply grabbed the ends of my shirt and ripped it open. As buttons went flying, his mouth came down on my right breast, and he began to alternately suck and lick my nipple. As a gasp escaped my lips, I threw my head back against the door and arched my spine to give him greater access. He moved from one breast to the other, continuing to tease, until my body was quivering under the delicious assault of teeth and tongue. I slipped my hands down his muscular stomach and quickly undid his jeans, pushing them down his hips. His cock was thick and hard, and oh so ready for action. But Jackson jerked away from my touch, his laugh vibrating against my chest. Do that, and this will all be over far too soon. I thought that was the point. Oh, it is. But a little foreplay never goes astray. Slip off your jeans. I did so, kicking them to one side. His jeans swiftly joined mine. Then he claimed my nipple again and lightly nipped. A shudder ran through me, even as his tongue replaced his teeth, gently soothing. Then his free hand found my clit, and he began to stroke and tease me, bringing me close to the edge, then pulling me back, until my whole body was shuddering with the need for release. Oh God, don't! I somehow managed as he pulled his touch away yet again. Don't what? He murmured. Do this? His fingers brushed my clit and slipped inside. A shuddering gasp escaped. Or this, he added, and removed his caress. I didn't reply. I couldn't reply. I just tightened my grip around his neck, wrapped my legs around his waist, and thrust him deep inside. His groan was every bit as deep and needy as mine had been only moments before. Then his hands cupped my butt, and he began to thrust, his movements so violent the door rattled in rhythm. I didn't care. All I wanted, all I needed, was him, deep, hard, and fast. Then the dam of pleasure he'd built so masterfully finally broke, and just for an instant I couldn't breathe, couldn't think, could only feel. And Lord, it was glorious. He came a heartbeat later, as the last shudders of pleasure left his body, he leaned his forehead against mine and closed his eyes. Neither of us moved. The only sound was the harsh rasp of our breathing and the light ticking of the wall clock. It really hadn't taken all that long, foreplay or not. Well, he said, pulling back enough to look me in the eyes. I think we both needed that. I brushed sweaty strands of hair away from his forehead, then dropped a kiss on his nose. So, back to work? Hell no. He shifted his grip on my butt, then swung around and walked toward the stairs. I have a bed upstairs, and I'm not afraid to use it. If you can get me up those stairs without either separation or breaking something, I'll give you two hours. He raised an eyebrow amusement touching his lips. And if I don't? Half an hour. Challenge accepted. And, needless to say, overcome. Jackson slowed the Range Rover and turned left into Scott Grove. What number are we looking for again? 
I opened the file sitting on my knee and scanned the somewhat scant information on Janice Green, Rosen Sr.'s secretary. We were vaguely hoping that she might be able to cast some light on Professor Wilson's habits, which in turn might help us find the lock that matched the second key we'd found in his shed. Thirty-eight, I said. Keep an eye on the numbers. I'll concentrate on getting this tank through the cars. Wonder how many of them belong to residents, and how many belong to students trying to avoid the university's parking fees. Probably most. He paused to squeeze the big SUV between two similar-sized vehicles. It was a tight fit. I know when I was a uni kid, I'd do anything and everything to avoid paying parking fees, including walking a fair distance to get to the place. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. I checked the street numbers and added, Have you heard anything about Rosen's replacement? We certainly hadn't heard anything from the company itself, and were currently working on the presumption they still wanted us to find Professor Wilson's missing research notes. But that didn't mean Jackson hadn't heard other rumours about the company. He had more contacts than I had years behind me. I seriously doubt that, he said with a half-laugh replying to my thought rather than my actual question. And I haven't got a contact who'd actually know anything about Rosen Pharmaceuticals. Then how did you find out all this stuff about Janice? Via your police contact? No. Taxation. There's no better source for basic information. That was true, given just how much information the taxation department wanted from people these days. Janice's place is on the right, the one with the high picket fence. He drove past and pulled into a driveway two houses down. I twisted around. 38 was a small, white-painted weatherboard home, with a weather-worn tile roof and a small green carport on one side. There were two cars in the driveway, one a Hyundai and the other a small Honda. I looked at Jackson's notes again. Janice drives the Honda. Wonder who the other one belongs to. Because if I remember right, she isn't married and had no lovers. It might be a friend rather than a lover. He glanced at me, amusement evident. At lunchtime. On a work day. People have been known to go home for lunch. They've also been known to go home for a bit of afternoon delight. Did she seem like the type for a little lunchtime rendezvous to you? Well, no. But never judge a book by its cover and all that. I snorted and glanced back at the house. Just in time to see the front door open, and Amanda Wilson, the professor's less-than-loving wife, and a woman who'd been bleeding him of information for the syndicati from the very first time they'd slept together, step out. Duck, I said and slid down behind the headrest. I'd really prefer just to grab the bitch. Do that and we might just lose our one chance of uncovering who her controller is. Jackson grunted and lifted up enough to look at the side mirror. She's in the car. You follow her. I'll go inside and see if Janice survived the encounter with our black widow. He frowned at me. Do you really think it's a wise move to split up? Given Amanda's history, yeah, I do. But she has a history of seducing men for information, not women. Which doesn't mean anything if her mind has been seized. I watched the Hyundai reverse out of the driveway. Wish we had a damn tracker. We do. It's in the little bag of tricks I threw onto the back seat. I gave him the look, the one that said, Don't be daft. I meant on the car. Something that can still be achieved if you get your lovely ass out of the car, so I can go stalk our quarry. I'll call once I know anything. Ditto. I stripped off my sweater and wrapped it around my head to conceal my hair. Amanda was far enough away now that she'd probably think the sweater was a scarf of some sort, which was infinitely better than her spotting the blaze of coppery red that was my hair. I climbed out and waited until Jackson had reversed out of the driveway, 
then ran across the road to Genesis. The Honda's hood was still warm, suggesting she hadn't been home all that long. The front door was locked, but a quick spurt of fire soon fixed that. I pushed it open with my fingertips. Janice? It's Emberly Pearson. I'm with Hellfire Investigations. We need to ask you a couple of questions. There was no answer. Aside from the soft ticking of an unseen clock, the house was silent. I frowned and took a wary step inside. Janice? Still nothing. There were four doorways along the somewhat narrow hallway, but only one of those was open. Instinct was annoyingly silent when it came to suggesting which one to investigate first. I took another step forward, then stopped. Heat teased my senses, but its flame was little more than a soft caress. It was coming from the room to my right, from what was most likely a bedroom, given most houses of this age tended to have their bathrooms either in the middle of the house or off the kitchen at the rear. I moved toward it, only to stop as I realized the air smelled. Odd. I took a deeper breath. Fuck. Gas. I bolted into the room that held the flickering heat source. Janice lay in among the tangled blankets. Her eyes were closed and her face slack. On the bedside tables, there were at least half a dozen lit candles. I waved a hand to snuff them out, then quickly felt Janice's neck for a pulse. Not only was it there, but it was strong and steady. Relief surged, but we weren't out of the woods just yet. I spun and ran for the kitchen, opening the doors to check each room as I went past. There were at least another dozen lit candles split between the various rooms. I erased every tiny flame, then slid into the combined kitchen and living area, found the oven, and quickly turned off all the jets. The stink of gas in this area was particularly strong, and it wouldn't have taken all that much longer for the build-up to reach the other rooms. Amanda had obviously intended to be well away from the place before it blew. I opened the back door, and as many windows as I could, then went back into the bedroom. Janice, wake up! I sat on the edge of the bed and roughly shook her shoulder. She didn't open her eyes, just waved a hand at me somewhat airily. Need sleep? Go away! Who was the woman who just left? What is her name? Felicity. Her slow smile basically confirmed what the state of the bed suggested. It was the oh-so-lovely Felicity. And she's your lover? Yes. Her smile grew. So lovely. And she seemed to be answering my questions altogether too readily, especially given she probably had no idea who I was. There should have at least been some sort of reaction to my presence in her bedroom. Something other than this happy compliancy, anyway. Does Felicity have a last name? I couldn't smell any alcohol on her breath, so I gently opened one eyelid. Her pupils were heavily dilated, suggesting she'd been drugged. But why, when Amanda was a powerful telepath who'd made a fortune stealing secrets from the minds of her lovers during intercourse? And while it was obvious Amanda had intended to blow the house apart, taking Janice and any evidence she might hold with it, it was also possible that whatever drugs she'd given the older woman to make her talk might be lethal. I dragged out my phone, called an ambulance, and then repeated my question. Hawking, Janice said after a moment. Felicity Hawking. And how long have you and Felicity been lovers? A few weeks. She shrugged and finally opened her eyes. The faintest hint of alarm crossed her expression. Who are you? Do I know you? If Amanda had been her lover for a few weeks, it meant she'd been so before the Syndicati had kidnapped us both, and her mind had been taken over. I'm Emberly Pearson. I'm one of the private investigators your boss employed to investigate the theft of research notes. 
He's dead. She closed her eyes again. Can't be sad about that. Which wasn't a surprising comment. Rosen Sr. certainly hadn't endeared himself to me in the brief time I'd known him, and I couldn't help but think he'd have been a difficult man to work with. Don't go to sleep, Janice. You need to stay with me. I need to sleep. Go away. Felicity has drugged you with God only knows what. You sleep, you might die. She wouldn't do that. She cares for me. Trust me, the woman you know as Felicity only cares about herself. And she not only could kill, but had. And multiple times. Do you know where she lives? Have you ever been to her place? No, but she has an apartment in Docklands. The Docklands area was currently very trendy, and therefore very expensive, so it wouldn't be surprising if Amanda did live there. But there was a hell of a lot of apartment buildings in that area, so we needed a little more information than that to track her down. She never gave you an address? No. Again, that wasn't really surprising, but it was frustrating. Did you at least get her phone number? Yes. She waved her hand airily, almost smacking me in the face. But you can't have it. She has a jealous husband who doesn't understand her. I snorted. Amanda had certainly had plenty of husbands over the years, but most of the poor buggers were well and truly dead. I saw him the other day, Janice continued. I don't think I was supposed to. Cold-looking fellow. Instinct stirred. Can you describe him? Tall, grey-haired, regal sort of nose. She sniffed. Drove a big black SUV. I took a picture. I blinked. Of him? Or the car? Because while that description might be on the vague side, it could easily fit Ronaldo. If it was him, we might have just gotten our first break. Both. Can I look at it? Will you leave me alone? I told you, I can't. You need an ambulance. I need sleep. She was drifting off again. I let her go for a moment and rose. Looking around the bedroom didn't reveal a handbag, so I walked down to the kitchen and found it sitting on the dining table, along with an empty wine bottle and two glasses. I opened the bag, then rummaged through until I found her cell. It wasn't locked, so I went straight into her contacts list and looked for Felicity's name. Unsurprisingly, it had been erased. I hit the album button, not expecting to find much, but the very first picture that came up was Ronaldo himself. His face was cool and controlled, but there was something in the way he was standing, watching Amanda approach, that made me want to reach into the photo and wrench her out of harm's way. Amanda was as far from innocent as you could get, but that look very much suggested he was using her in every way possible. And I couldn't imagine Ronaldo would be either a gentle or generous lover. I zoomed in on the rear of the SUV and almost cheered. The number plate was crisp and clear. We finally had something that might help us track the bastard down. I shoved her phone into my back pocket and returned to the bedroom. Janice was asleep, so I shook her roughly. Her response was sleepy and somewhat colourful. I grinned and glanced at my watch. I probably had another five minutes or so before the ambulance arrived, so I decided to use that time to see what other information I could uncover. Janice, what can you tell me about the inverter device the company was developing? I already answered that question, she said, her voice holding a hint of annoyance. Not to me, she hadn't. And if that was one of the questions Amanda had been asking, then it meant Ronaldo hadn't yet gotten his hands on the device. I know, but tell me again anyway. She yawned hugely. We had prototypes up and running, but some official government department came in a few weeks ago and secured the whole project. 
It was all very dramatic. A few weeks ago meant it had happened before Rosen had been murdered, which meant, hopefully, that they were government officials rather than syndicati goons or rats in disguise. As the wail of an approaching siren got louder, I said, What can you tell me about the project Professor Wilson was working on? She shrugged. Nothing. It was all very hush-hush. And Wilson himself. Do you know much about him? Not really. Rosen called him into the office a couple of times, but I can't tell you why. She couldn't really tell me much about anything, it seemed. Which made me wonder why Amanda, and therefore Ronaldo, had made the attempt to kill her. Unless, of course, he was simply making sure no one else could pull any information out of her. The sound of the approaching siren was so close now, the ambulance could only be a street or so away. I pulled Janice's cell from my pocket, then dug out my phone to grab the inspector's number and called her. Chief Inspector Henrietta Richmond speaking. Her tone was cool and somewhat reserved, no doubt because I was calling her from an unknown number, and undoubtedly it was already being traced. How may I assist you? Inspector, it's Emberley. Amanda Wilson just made an attempt on Janice Green's life after apparently pumping her for information over the last couple of weeks. There was a slight pause. Interesting. I take it Janice is still alive. Yes, but she's been drugged with who knows what. I've called an ambulance. Yes, I can hear it. What happened to Amanda? Jackson's following her. We're hoping she might lead us to Ronaldo's location. We weren't aware Amanda was working for him. Nor were we. Though we had suspected it. Janice apparently saw them together. She has a pic of them beside an SUV, and the number plate is crystal clear. I read it out to her. I'll get it traced immediately, the inspector said. Stay with the secretary. I'll get someone over to check out her house. If they attempted to erase her, she must know something. Keep me informed on her condition. Will do, Inspector. I hesitated. Were you aware that some government officials took the inverters and all the information relating to them from Rosen Pharmaceuticals a few weeks ago? Yes, I am. So they were actual government officers, and not fakes? I persisted. Yes. Amusement touched her tone. You are not one for giving up until you get what you want, are you? It depends on what it is I want, I replied. Did you discover what that chemical formula was? It's vinegar, apparently. We're searching the buildings under the skipping girl vinegar sign, as that's the most obvious place to start. Luke was unlikely to have done anything obvious, but I guess the search had to start somewhere. What about the original premises on Burnley Street? Those buildings were demolished, but we've nevertheless sent the military to the area, as well as several other smaller factories that are actively producing vinegar. I doubt they'll find anything at such a place, I said. I agree, but they must still be checked. The wail of the siren stopped, and the silence was almost eerie. I walked down to the front door. Two men climbed out of the ambulance and were walking toward me, the first of them holding a medical kit. The patient is inside. I stepped to one side to let them both in. But as I did, I realized the second man was wearing jeans and sneakers, rather than the usual black or blue pants and black boots. Government funding might be tight right now, but I doubted the use of casual clothing as part of their everyday uniform had been approved. The first bedroom, he said, his gaze cold and altogether too watchful. Tension crawled through me, but I forced a smile. Yes, I think she's taken something. Emberly, the inspector said. Everything okay? You didn't answer my question. 
I didn't even hear her question. I forced a smile, then said, No, sorry, it's not. We'll get people there ASAP. Leave the line open. Fine, see you soon. I shoved the phone into my back pocket, but as ordered, didn't hang up. She conscious? Talking. The first ambulance officer continued. No. I stepped back again, giving him plenty of room to pass. The second man didn't follow him. Instead, he stopped and placed a hand on the doorframe, effectively stopping me from leaving. And though I didn't feel the wash of any sort of power, the charm at my neck sprang to life, its heat a warning that magic was being aimed my way. You related to the victim? he asked, the faintest hint of a smile touching his thin lips. Overconfidence had been the downfall of many a thug. No, I'm not. I threw a ball of fire sideways to catch his gaze, then took a step forward and kicked him hard in the nuts. As he gasped and doubled over, I swung a fist at his chin and smashed him sideways. He hit the wall hard enough to dent it, then collapsed in a heap on the floor. Though I heard no footsteps, the warm rush of air past the back of my neck was warning enough that the other thug was closing in. I swung round, but wasn't quite fast enough. The blow hit me low in the stomach and sent me tumbling backward. I landed on my spine and slid backward for a yard or so, gathering splinters from the porch's old boards. I swore and struggled to my feet, fire flickering across my fingertips, ready to defend or attack. Something hit my arm, and I glanced down to see a silvery dart sticking out of it. Fuck. I wrenched it out and reached for my fires, then heard a shout from the street and swung around to see two women watching me. You're right, one asked. No, I wasn't, because they were there and that meant I dared not take fire form and reveal what I truly was. Fine, I muttered and ran for the gate. The thug didn't chase me. He didn't need to. I was out before I got anywhere near the front gate. Chapter 8 The rise to consciousness was abrupt. One minute I was out, the next I was awake. It was the sort of abruptness that wasn't natural, but rather the result of some sort of stimulant, I could feel it coursing through my body, making my heart race. But worse than that was the sudden awareness that I wasn't alone, that there were two others in the place with me. Both were male, and if their voices were any guide, they were very familiar. One of them was Ronaldo's witch. The other was Theodore Hunt, the werewolf hitman who'd sworn to kill me because I'd apparently ruined his reputation by stopping him from committing murder. Not once, but twice. Fire rose, unbidden. But rather than erupting from my skin, it continued to rage within me and seemed to hold little in the way of heat. Something, someone, had managed to restrict my most powerful weapon. It wasn't difficult to guess who. I forced my eyes open. Something dangled in front of my gaze. I blinked, trying to focus and saw what looked like multicolored strings entwined together. It was Grace's charm, loosely wrapped around a decidedly bony-looking finger, rather than my neck. That was the reason my flames were restricted. With the charm no longer around my neck, its protective barrier had been deactivated, and Frederick's spell had finally been able to curtail my flames. But was my access to the mother similarly stopped? And dare I even reach for her after what had happened last time? This, Frederick said, his voice conversational, is a rather brilliant bit of spell casting. Who made it for you? A witch. It came out croaky. I swallowed heavily, but it didn't ease the dryness in my throat. I wondered how long I'd been out. Wondered what in hell they'd given me. Obviously, he said. 
But who? She's someone I'd be interested in speaking to. I doubt speaking is what you'd be doing. Not after what happened to those three witches you helped infect. Infect, yes. But you, my dear, killed them. He leaned closer, his pale features looming out of the darkness, in an almost ghost-like manner. Or maybe it just seemed that way, thanks to his gaunt, almost skeletal features. Tell me who it is. How about you go fuck yourself? I reached for the mother. Energy surged at my call, but it was a distant thing, a heat I could feel but not yet use. Frederick's spell had placed a barrier between us, but it was one that restricted my access, rather than completely forbade it. And that suggested his power was the darker kind, the kind that came from blood sacrifice and personal energy, rather than from the earth and the energy of the world itself. He undoubtedly knew about both, but he'd had little experience with the mother and no true understanding of her. Which was both good and bad. It meant I should be able to access her given time, but time was something I might not have a whole lot of. Frederick sighed. Theodore, please show Miss Pearson the error of her ways. Heat surged at his words, but once again it did little more than flare across my skin. Touch me, I said, and I'll fucking kill you. Hunt chuckled. It was a cold and oddly demented sound. But then he and Sanity had never particularly been bosom buddies. The darkness near my feet shifted, became something that was big and powerful, and whose eyes promised death. With almost loving care, he gripped the littlest toe on my left foot. Knowing what was coming, I began to struggle, but I was tied down far too well, both physically and magically. All I could do was send heat surging down to my foot and hope it was enough. My skin began to glow so fiercely it cast an orange light across the shadows and lent Hunt's gaze a bloody glow. It didn't help. Either Hunt didn't feel the heat, or he simply didn't care, because he gripped my toe tighter and simply forced it backward. Pain ripped through me, and I screamed. Hunt sucked in a deep breath, then sighed, the sound almost orgasmic. Bastard, I thought dazedly. Sick, dead bastard. Fingers gripped my chin and forced my head sideways. Frederick's skeletal features came into view. Tell me the name of the witch who gave you that charm, or would you rather Hunt break another toe? Hunt's fingers moved to my next toe. They were trembling slightly, but whether that was anticipation or desire, I had no idea, and no real wish to find out. I reached again for the mother. This time the wash of her heat was stronger, and the invisible wall between us seemed to shudder. Time. I just needed goddamn time. And that meant I had to keep them talking, keep them from doing whatever it was they intended doing. Like he isn't going to anyway. Oh, trust me. He intends a whole lot more than merely breaking toes. He lightly patted my arm, as if to comfort me. It was only then that I realized I was naked. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I closed my eyes and tried to control the wash of panic. I could get through this. I could survive it. And it wasn't like it hadn't happened before. No one, man or woman, could live through as many decades as I had without being violated in some way. Not even those of us who weren't human. The name, Emily. Frederick said. Call Hunt off, and you might have a deal. You are in no position to make any sort of deal, I'm afraid. He slid his bony fingers down my arm, and then across to my stomach, letting them rest just above my pubic bone. You are, however, in a perfect position to fuck. And while that is something Hunt wants so very much... I rather suspect you do not. 
I couldn't help glancing down at Hunt. His eyes glowed in anticipation. Answering all your questions isn't going to stop him doing that, I said. And we both know it. Perhaps not. But the only way you will know for sure is to answer the question. I closed my eyes. The mother's heat was close, so damn close. I could almost touch her now. And the fact that I couldn't had tears of rage and frustration stinging my eyes. I took a deep, shuddering breath and released it slowly. Patience. I just had to have patience. Why do you want her name? What do you and your psycho boss want from her? My psycho boss wants nothing from her, Frederick said. In fact, he would be rather peeved by my actions. I blinked. You're not here on his orders? No. Frederick drew in a deep breath and smiled benignly. I do so love the smell of fear and rampant need. The latter is Hunt's, of course, not yours. He was as sick as Hunt, and just as dead, or would be when I broke through to the mother. I wouldn't think going against someone like Ronaldo would be the best idea, I said. You're right. It's not. He produced a knife and flicked the blade open. But what he doesn't know won't hurt him. The name, Emberly. Otherwise, this knife will taste the sweetness of your flesh. I hesitated. The knife's point replaced his fingers against my pubic bone. Sweat broke out across my brow and dribbled down the side of my face. Or maybe that was tears. Rhonda Peterson! Her name is Rhonda Peterson! Indeed. Frederick glanced at Hunt. Do we believe her, Theodore? With the drug in her system, she can't lie. His reply was little more than a low, husky growl. It has to be the truth. I bit back a harsh laugh. If they believed that, then they truly knew little about phoenixes. No drug designed to work on a human would ever be able to withstand the sheer amount of heat currently boiling through my system. Indeed, Frederick repeated. What did you and Miller find in Brooklyn? Rotting dead people, I replied. What sort of sick spell was that? It was neither my magic protecting that area, nor my spell cast on those cloaks. Then why were they rotting? That, it would appear, was an unfortunate side effect of the virus. I blinked. It rots you? Not everyone. Did you never wonder why some infected were branded and some were not? It was easier to identify which type of infected we were dealing with. Meaning those who were branded were the ones who would putrefy? Yes. It is also what sends them mad. Meaning Sam, and Jackson, if he was still infected, should be safe. Unfortunately, it also meant that Frederick was. Not that that would really matter. Not once I got free. What else did you discover? He said. Nothing much. The tip of the knife pierced my skin, and blood began to flow. I'm not believing that, Frederick said. If you were Luke's second, you should know what was in that area. Oh, I know there were labs somewhere in Brooklyn, but he would never reveal their location. So much for your earlier boast that he completely trusted you, I said. Frederick smiled benignly. Boasts and lies all have one purpose, to make people like you do as we wish. And if that doesn't work... The knife sliced deeper into my skin, and pain flared brighter. I really was going to enjoy hurting this bastard. Did you teach Luke to use magic? My voice was still surprisingly without inflection, which was a good thing. Hunt was already enjoying himself far too much for my liking. That, I believe, 
was an unfortunate side effect of the infection. He could not control me, but he did have some access to my thoughts and memories. Did you find the labs, Emberly? I don't fucking know. We found an airlock that's accessible through a hidden entrance in his office. But whether that's the labs or merely a large safe is anyone's guess. There was little point in lying about what we'd found. If Ronaldo did have a mole in PIT, he was probably aware of what went down there. It also meant all this was pretty pointless. Unless, of course, Frederick was simply confirming information they already had. And did you manage to gain access? No. It was code-locked and had a hand scanner attached. Meaning it will take some time to break in. His expression was irritated. Which means more unfortunate delays. For whom? And where are the scientists? I didn't really expect an answer, and I didn't get it. Instead, he withdrew the knife's tip from my skin. You, my dear, are far too dangerous to keep around. Ronaldo might think he has you by the short and curlies. He paused, amusement touching his thin lips as he wiggled the knife back and forth across my pubic hair. Tension rolled through me as I waited for the flick of pain that came with flesh being pierced. But it didn't happen. Not this time, at any rate. I, however... Do not believe that to be wise. He hasn't finished with me, Frederick. I wouldn't... Oh, he's going to be incredibly annoyed by my actions. He cut in. But he and I have been business partners for a very long time. One might even say decades. He will, in the end, respect my actions. Decades? That wasn't possible not without him either being non-human or a thrall. But even if he had sworn blood service, thereby becoming Ronaldo's human servant and gaining a very extended lifespan in exchange, he wouldn't have the free will to do something like this. Unless, of course, being a dark witch gave him some sort of immunity. Hunt's hand came down on top of Frederick's and stopped the knife's movement. Relief washed through me, though it was tempered not only by the knowledge that Hunt's ministrations would be far worse, but also by the feel of his fat fingers splayed across my belly. Enough, he growled. She is mine to take apart, remember? Indeed. Frederick's gaze came back to mine. Which also means I can hardly be held accountable for your death, especially given there are no witnesses to your kidnapping. No witnesses? What about those women? Those women only saw two ambulance officers who are now no longer with us. He smirked. Dead men can tell no tales, after all. Of course, the same can be said of dead women. Perhaps it would be better if I simply rid the world. We have a deal, Hunt cut in. One sworn on blood and magic. If Hunt believed Frederick would keep any deal that didn't suit him, then he was a bigger fool than I presumed. Of course, he was also a fool who had the upper hand right at this moment, but only for as long as I was restrained from the mother's power. We do indeed, Frederick said, altogether too cheerfully. If that didn't warn Hunt the deal wasn't worth the blood it was sworn on, nothing would. Which means, dear Emberly, I must now leave you to Theodore's tender ministrations. Hunt removed his hand, and Frederick raised the blade. He licked its tip, and then sighed almost wistfully. In many respects, it is such a shame to waste your blood— there is such power in it. But a deal is a deal. Goodbye, Emberly. With that, he turned and disappeared into the darkness. A second later, a door closed, and footsteps retreated down what sounded like a metal walkway, leaving me alone with Hunt. I closed my eyes, reaching for strength and the fires that burned deep within. 
All that did was make my skin glow. There was no heat in my fire. No threat. Frederick had designed his spell very well indeed. Hunt chuckled again, but it was the accompanying sound that sent fear and desperation rushing through me. He was stripping off. I twisted and heaved, fighting the cables that bound my arms and legs, trying to find some give, trying to free myself. My wrists and ankles became raw and slick with blood, but it did little good. I swore and raged and reached harder for the mother. Her fires twisted and spun, a whirlpool of heat that was close, so damn close, that I could feel the wash of it. But while the threads of magic holding her from my grasp were beginning to unravel against the constant pressure, they hadn't yet collapsed. I have dreamed of this. The thick scent of his desire was suffocating, and his eyes were glazed and unfocused, drunk on desire and the sight of my helplessness. For endless nights. I will kill you, I spat back be it in this time or another. He smiled benignly, hoisting himself up on the table, and knelt inside my splayed legs. His cock was thick and hard, and stood out from his body like a lance waiting to be used. His hands came down on both sides of my shoulders, and heat and hate were all I could smell, all I could see. I'm going to fuck you, senseless, and then I'm going to tear you apart piece by tiny piece and scatter you to the four winds. Try coming back from that, Phoenix. With that, he thrust inside of me. It hurt. God, how it hurt. But I bit back my scream and my instinctive need to fight both the bonds and the man that pinned me. That had already proven useless, just as useless as my fire for as long as the witch's spell was online. I needed to reach the mother, needed to concentrate on shattering the magic that separated us, rather than on what was happening to my body. But as much as I tried, I couldn't entirely ignore Hunt's invasion. When he was fully sheathed within me, he shifted his weight, then stopped. I didn't react. I just kept my eyes closed and kept reaching for the mother. The magic was so thin it was little more than gossamer. I could feel her heat and her rage now, but neither would do me much good if the gossamer held on. Hunt wrapped a hand around my jaw and squeezed hard. Look at me. Never. His grip tightened. Tears slid down my cheeks. Don't think I won't break your jaw. Look at me. I did. There was little point in doing anything else, and I certainly didn't want a broken jaw in addition to a broken toe. Hunt's expression was gloating. He didn't release me. He simply began to thrust again. Call me master. Master, I said tonelessly. His movements became more intense. Again. Master. His breaths were becoming shorter, sharper, and his eyes more glazed. Again. Again, louder. Master, I intoned dutifully. You are my master. He made a strangled sound, his body stiffening against mine. But even as he came, the wall finally shattered, the mother swept through me and into Hunt, searing both his seed and his cock in one swift action. And then she paused, as if waiting for reaction to set in. It did. His eyes bulged, and his groan of ecstasy became a scream of sheer and utter agony. A heartbeat later, the mother snatched the rest of him from existence. There was nothing left, nothing except the lingering echo of his agony. The cables binding me were treated with similar contempt. Then the mother's energy wrapped around me, warm arms that offered comfort and a place of safety. A part of me wanted to linger, to grow strong in her grip, to give in and let go. 
but that part of me had little hope against the greater sum that wanted revenge. I had a witch to catch, and no time to waste. I hauled myself off the metal table, standing on one foot as I studied the room. If the machinery parts still scattered about were anything to go by, this place had once been some sort of pump room. I couldn't spot any spell stones on either those bits and pieces or the floor. But the rainbow flare of the mother's light made something glitter in a small, recessed section of the grimy wall to my right. I directed her energy at it, and, with very little fanfare, the entire wall disappeared. Dust ballooned, catching in my throat and making me cough. I didn't care, because the minute that wall collapsed, my fires returned. I was torn from flesh to flame in an instant, a process made even headier by the mother's presence. Her song continued to spin around me, sweet and beguiling, but it was a temptation that stood little chance against the darker tune in my heart. I dismissed her and flamed under the doorway. I wasn't entirely surprised to discover I was once again in the sewer tunnel. I flowed down the metal steps to the tunnel's door, sending spiders and rats scattering as I raced after the footsteps I could no longer hear. In very little time I came to a junction, and it was one that felt oddly familiar. I paused, the brightness of my flame sending yellow-white light spinning across the grimy bricks, and highlighting not only the gated entrance to one of the offshoot tunnels, but also the shattered remains of a metal barrel. This was the junction where two of the kidnapped witches had eaten their friend, and where I'd been attacked and almost killed by hellhounds. The place was silent now, and though the tunnel that had held the hounds was once again barred, I had no sense that anyone or anything was in there. Instinct tugged me left, into the tunnel opposite the one Jackson and I had used. The thought stalled. Jackson. What if Amanda had been nothing more than a ruse? What if she'd been used to split us? The best way to conquer was to divide. History and experience told me that. And Rinaldo obviously knew enough about my character to guess that I wouldn't leave without at least checking that Janice was safe. Even if Frederick was being honest, and his actions were his alone, rather than Rinaldo's orders... Amanda's presence at the house could still have been some sort of trap, especially given neither of us had reported back to him as specifically ordered. But to contact Jackson and make sure he was okay, I'd have to change form, because only another phoenix could understand me when I was in this one. And as much as I hated to admit it, my need to grab Frederick was stronger than my fear for Jackson. I moved on, into the smaller tunnel, the same one the Red Cloaks had come from as the Hellhounds had attacked in the junction. I could once again hear footsteps, but they were distant and oddly seemed to be moving toward me, rather than away. Had Frederick forgotten something? Or had Rinaldo caught wind of his little scheme and ordered him back? I flamed around another corner, only to run right into someone. As my flames surrounded him, energy surged, a response that was protective and familiar. It wasn't Frederick. It was Jackson. M, he yelled, both aloud and in my head. It's me! Tone down the heat! I did so and immediately changed form. What the fuck are you doing here? What the fuck do you think I'm doing here? He grabbed me, pulled me close and wrapped his arms around me, tightly. His whole body shook, and I doubted it was a reaction to almost being crisped. It actually felt a whole lot like rage. I'm here to rescue you. I'm okay. Don't give me that shit. I know what happened. I pulled away from him, my gaze searching his. Not only was there rage, but also horror and a very deep sense of defilement. Oh, fuck. He'd felt it. Everything that had happened to me in that old pump house had echoed through him. I'm sorry, Jackson. I should have thought, don't, he growled. Because you have nothing to apologize for.
But... He placed a finger gently against my lips, stopping me. Are you okay? I'm cut, and my damn toe is broken. I don't just mean physically. I knew that. I'll be fine. Eventually. It wasn't like it was the first time it had happened, and while that didn't really ease the trauma of this event, I not only knew how I'd probably react, but also how to cope with the flashbacks, nightmares, and anger, if they did occur. But I doubted Jackson had ever experienced something like that, even if it was just an echo, rather than a real event. I raised my hand and gently cupped his cheek and chin. The real question is, how are you? I haven't really stopped to think about it. I just wanted to get here, get to you, and stop it happening. He took a deep breath and released it slowly. At the very least, there will be anger. But we can get through it together. I hoped so. I hoped that he'd talk about it rather than let it fester in the deeper recesses of his mind, gathering guilt and blame until it poisoned our relationship and he ended up hating me. So how did you find me? Tracked your phone. Or rather, PIT did. I know you wanted that number kept private, but... This time I put my finger against his lips. It's okay, Jackson. It wasn't my phone. And I would have done the same thing anyway. Good. He released me, stepped back, then stripped off his coat, and held it out so I could slip my arms into it. It also means that three PIT officers are no more than a few minutes behind me. Which wasn't really surprising, not with Ronaldo's right-hand man having been involved. I don't suppose you came across Frederick on your way here, did you? As a matter of fact, we did. He's currently unconscious and being hauled none too gently back to the scene of his crime. I frowned. Why is PIT bringing him back here, rather than taking him to PIT headquarters? Because the man in charge just happens to be Sam, and he was decidedly determined to make sure you were okay. Under normal circumstances, news like that might have made my heart do a little jig. But I was all out of that sort of happiness right now. Then ring him and tell him I'm okay. As much as I wanted to question Frederick myself, it was probably better if I didn't. I wasn't entirely sure my control could withstand the desire to make the bastard pay. No need, Sam said as he appeared around the corner. The flashlight's beam swept me, no doubt taking in my near nakedness, the bloody bruises around my ankles and wrists, and the dried blood trails down my legs. The only indication that I'd suffered wounds elsewhere. Something hardened in his eyes, and the air around him grew dark almost explosive. He and I might no longer be an item, but if that darkness was anything to go by, Frederick was going to pay for his actions. Big time. He stopped to the right of both Jackson and me, his expression giving little away, but the darkness still fierce and bright, and very, very scary. Where's Hunt? So dead he's not even dust. Good. Where did the assault happen? Though his tone was so matter-of-fact it edged toward curtness, I couldn't help but notice his hands were clenched. Couldn't help but sense he wanted revenge every bit as badly as either Jackson or I. And maybe he would have reacted the same way had I simply been a fellow PIT officer, or even a member of the public. But I suspected the fact we'd once loved each other had a whole lot to do with whatever he was now planning. It happened in what I think is an old pump room. I paused. Why? Because if you're up to it, Frederick is going to receive a little of his own medicine. The smile that touched his lips was an ugly thing to behold. It's more than deserved, don't you think? That is something of an understatement, Jackson commented, even as I said, I'm up to it. More lights began to pierce the gloom, 
accompanied by the sound of footsteps as well as something being dragged. I couldn't help hoping that something was Frederick. Lead the way, Sam said. I wrapped the ends of Jackson's coat tighter around my bruised body, then spun and hobbled forward. Jackson muttered something under his breath, then swept me up into his arms. You direct. I'll do the walking. Just follow this tunnel until we hit the junction. I glanced across at Sam. Though his expression was remote, something in the set of his mouth spoke of annoyance. Have the searches of the various vinegar factories turned up anything? Vinegar factories? Jackson said. That's what the chemical formula you found in Brooklyn was, Sam said, his tone clipped. He stepped over the rotting carcass of what looked like a cat, then added, And no, it hasn't yet. It's possible it was nothing more than a red herring. Maybe it was, but something within me doubted it. It might have been the only clue they could leave without being obvious. The scientists are infected, Sam said. I doubt they would have even considered such a thing. I think the scientists are more likely to be like you than regular red cloaks. I paused, remembering what Frederick said about the decaying cloaks we'd discovered in Brooklyn. Were you aware that the cloaks with the brand on their cheeks had a variation of the virus that rotted them out? Sam's smile was grim. Yes, and we're not entirely sure that it's a variation, rather than a path that all of those who are infected will travel. If that was going to happen, there'd at least be signs by now. You can't be sure of that. No one can. Luke was. I might not have asked him that question, but I nevertheless believed the truth of my answer. And I'm pretty sure if you ask Frederick about the virus, he'll confirm it. There are bigger questions to be asked before we get to something like that, Sam said. Like, where were the scientists? And where the hell was Ronaldo? I think Frederick is a thrall. He implied as much when he was questioning me. Sam's gaze shot to mine. What was he questioning you about? He wanted the name of a witch. I wasn't inclined to supply it. Why would he want that sort of information from you? Jackson said. He was impressed by her skill and creativity. Take the tunnel on our immediate right, I added as we hit the junction once again. Why is this place familiar? Jackson said. It's where the hellhounds attacked me. I won't even ask, Sam said. I gather the creativity Frederick was talking about was the twined rope charm he was clutching when we nabbed him. Yes. Don't suppose you have it with you, do you? He pulled a plastic bag from his pocket, but didn't immediately offer it to me. What is it designed to protect you against? Any magic or spell created to stop me from accessing my fire form. Magic can do that? It can if you know the right magic. If you do. My gaze narrowed. Why? Are you thinking about pursuing such a spell? There's no need to, now that you're working with us rather than against. He held out the plastic bag. After a moment's hesitation, I accepted it. Don't you have to hand it in or something? I'll log it. But it's better off with you rather than sitting in an evidence locker. He paused. I would, however, like to talk to the witch who created it. PIT could certainly use some means of protection against spells. My eyebrows rose. Has that actually been a problem? Only minor to date, but yes. I'm surprised PIT hasn't got witches on the books, Jackson commented. It would seem a rather logical step if you ask me. We do have witch consultants, Sam said. But I don't think they are powerful enough to create something like that charm. Given Grace was powerful enough to work through and understand the Earth Mother, that wasn't really surprising. 
I doubted there were many witches in Melbourne capable of such a feat. Not now that three of them had died in these damn tunnels. Getting back to the problem currently being dragged along behind us, I said. What's the point of bringing Frederick back to the scene of his crime when, as a thrall, he would never betray his master? He may not be willing to tell us anything, but he could certainly be forced to. Ronaldo will stop him. We both know that. I spotted the metal stairs that led up to the half-wrecked pump room and silently directed Jackson toward it. Ronaldo can only stop him if he is aware of the situation. He won't be. And how do you intend to stop that? I can't. Adam, however, can. He's one of the men dragging Frederick here, and he should be able to prevent Frederick from linking with Ronaldo. Adam was Sam's partner, and a vampire to boot. I'd met him only a couple of times, but he seemed pretty decent. He'd certainly been a whole lot less frosty toward me than Sam had been in the early days of the investigation. But Ronaldo's an extremely powerful telepath, one capable of entirely taking over mind and body, I said. Will Adam have the telepathic strength to counter that? Because I rather suspect Ronaldo will kill Frederick rather than risk him telling us anything. I doubt Ronaldo will waste such a valuable resource. Don't doubt, Jackson said as he clattered up the metal steps. He would discard anything and anyone, no matter how valuable, if it suited him. Perhaps. Sam's tone suggested he didn't agree. Jackson kicked the door open, then strode into the old pump room. It was as I'd left it, only the dust had had a chance to settle. How do you want to play this, Turner? Once we get Frederick securely tied to the table, we'll all retreat back to the sewers except for Emberly and Adam. Jackson frowned. What about the possibility of him using magic? He's a dark witch, and from what I understand, they not only need some sort of blood sacrifice to create their spells, but also their asthma. Sam said. I wouldn't be sure about that, I said. If Frederick's a thrall, he could be far older than he looks. Older witches often don't need ceremonial devices. They just need the power of their thoughts and their soul to create a spell. Especially if it's only a simple one, such as forcing his will on another. I know someone who'd be able to tell us. Jackson carefully placed me on my feet near the table. Then, as the sound of footsteps coming up the metal stairs began to echo... He got out his phone and made a call. Grace, sorry about the late hour, but I have a rather urgent question for you. He paused for a moment, listening, and then added, Yeah, we did find the Dark Witch, but we need to question him, and we want to know if he can use magic against us using just his thoughts and will. He paused again, listening. His expression suggested the answer wasn't the one he wanted. Right. Thanks, Grace. He hung up and shoved his phone back into his pocket. Em's right. He'll more than likely be able to perform at least minor magic against us. However, she said if we use some form of hallucinogenic drug, it should impair his mind enough to stop that. No matter what either of you think of P.I.T., Sam said, his voice dry. We generally don't carry any sort of drugs around with us. Adam and one other PIT officer came into the room, dragging the still unconscious Frederick between them. Once they'd lifted him onto the table, they began tying him up with what looked like plastic cables. PIT might not carry drugs around with them, but it seemed they did come equipped with black cable ties. Frederick woke me with some sort of stimulant, I said, looking around. It's possible there is some sort of medical bag in the room, especially given he used an ambulance to transport me. It's over in the corner, Jackson said. And so are your clothes and purse by the look of it. He retrieved all three items, 
shaking off the brick dust from my clothes and purse, before handing them to me. Then he dumped the medical bag on top of Frederick's stomach and opened it up. There's all sorts of stuff in here. Anyone know anything about drugs? Adam, Sam said. Adam's a medic? I couldn't keep the surprise from my voice. No, I'm not, he said, his expression amused. He was a tall, thin man with blondish hair and cool grey eyes. He looked non-threatening, even for a vampire, and for that reason alone I suspected he was very much the opposite. But I can contact base, and someone who is. Instant communication is one of the benefits of having a telepathic partner, Sam said. Adam began inspecting the contents of the bag, studying each item and presumably relaying the information back to whomever he was in contact with. I used the time to pull on my jeans. Surprisingly, Janice's phone was still in my back pocket. I pulled it out, ended the call, and then quickly added a password. Having a second phone could come in handy. I didn't bother pulling on my shoes. I doubted my broken toe would be too pleased with the sudden pressure. Nor did I bother with my sweater or bra, instead shoving both into my handbag. I wasn't about to strip off to put either on, even if half the men in the room had seen me naked, be it in the present or the past. Which left my t-shirt, and I used that to belt Jackson's coat tighter. After a few more minutes... Adam handed Sam a small vial and a needle. According to Billy, this should do the trick. Excellent. Sam filled the syringe, then roughly jabbed it into Frederick's arm. Once he'd dumped both the vial and the syringe back into the bag, he glanced at me and said, We'll retreat. Adam will remain here with you, but Frederick shouldn't sense him. I nodded. Jackson gripped my shoulder briefly, and warmth leapt from his skin to mine. Warmth and concern. I smiled and silently thought, I'm okay, Jackson. Really? He didn't say anything, just gave me a somewhat disbelieving look, then followed Sam and the other PIT officers out the door. As it clanged shut, I glanced at Adam and said, So how do we play this? This is your game. I'm just here to stop any sort of connection happening. Sparks danced across my fingertips in anticipation. How close is he to consciousness? Close enough. Good. I hobbled forward, raised a hand and slapped Frederick across the cheek. The blow was hard enough to snap his head sideways, but there was no immediate response. I slapped him again. His eyes popped open and he swore, but the words were slow and somewhat slurred. Then his gaze narrowed, and I rather suspected he was reaching for some sort of magic. I didn't wait to see if the drug we'd administered had worked. I simply slapped him for a third time. I might not know a whole lot about magic, but I knew spells needed the caster's undivided attention. If rattling his teeth disrupted that, I was more than happy to keep doing it. Frederick, you have one chance, and one chance only, to tell me what I want to know, or I'm going to burn you piece by tiny piece until you're screaming for the salvation of death. Frederick's smile was cool and altogether too calm. You can hurt me as much as you like, but I will never tell you anything. I can't. I'm not so sure about that, I said. I'm thinking your inability to give me answers might rely on your master's restrictions rather than any sort of mental strength on your part. Perhaps that is so, but it still means I can't give you anything. A statement that is true only if you can actually reach Ronaldo, and I rather think you can't right now. He was silent for a minute, his expression slackening, suggesting he was attempting to reach Ronaldo telepathically. Then it came to life again, filled with a mix of fury and fear. What have you done to me? His body jerked as he tried to leap at me, but he was too well tied to move even the smallest amount. 
so he settled for raising his head and spitting. I sizzled the globule long before it got anywhere near me. It's not much fun being on the other side of things, is it? I'll get you for this, bitch. Sweat was beginning to dot his forehead. I wondered if it was fear or the drug taking hold. If it was the drug, then maybe I needed to speed things along. Keeping him confused as well as fearful was probably my best means of assault right now. I dropped my right hand and streamed fire from my fingertips, and then shaped them into humanoid forms that slowly grew, until the table was surrounded by fiery beings that glared at him balefully. What the fuck? he said, his voice high. Who are they? The thing about attacking a spirit, I said conversationally, 